Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Ward, a Doof Media podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss Ward while those return to the world of parahumans. My name is Matt Freeman, and I would like to offer my co-host Scott Daly these tokens of my power. What, uh, what do they do? <laughs> Nothing sinister. They just make you want to murder people. Uh, didn't catch that, but now I'm sinking through the floor. Anyway, this is the weekly podcast where Matt and I eagerly dive into Wild Bo's world of symbolic glasses adjustment, barf eating, and alien-based death powers as we analyze and interpret this ongoing web serial. This week, we are continuing our journey through Arc 12 Heavens with chapters 12.f and 12.7. At long last, Matt, the Cradle interlude is here, and as expected, he's a complex, rich character that I still hope dies. <laughs> then Victoria and company have to deal with a pissed-off, guilt-written Cradle, and it's a massive, massive cape fight involving guns, barf ingestion, and most importantly, Victoria telling her mom to fuck off. Matt, what did you think of these two chapters? Well, the Cradle Interlude uh, instantly took its place as one of my favorite Wild Bo chapters of all time. Um, so that, that should speak for itself. And then with the Victoria chapter, we have what is basically... Um, I feel like I say this a lot, but but a culmination of a lot of stuff that's been set up over time. We we have a lot of lines being crossed. Um, everyone, including Victoria, is well on the other side of all of the lines that at the start of the story they said they were never going to cross and, and had really, really strong feelings about. And uh, it's, it's chaotic. It's violent. Uh, people are trying to kill each other. And I can't wait to talk about it. Yeah, what I like about these two chapters is each of them kind of have this this clear motif surrounding it, right? We have the 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 cradle chapter, the image of his glasses and the symbolism behind his glasses are kind of like the thing that carry us thematically through his journey. Um, and then in the Victoria chapter, we have this um, this kind of rumination on power and leadership as she's struggling up against a, a leader that is very different from her. And we kind of see her journey throughout this one chapter um, that, like you said, is playing off of everything that has been building up over the course of this arc and this entire book um, into her struggling with how to best lead this group and and maybe a, a requirement that that leadership change. And I always like these chapters when they have this very clear, like, like individual focused, small thematic through line in them. And so, yeah, I liked both of these a whole lot. Yeah. Um all right, well, let's let's as soon as possible get into talking about them. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess first, just a reminder to everyone that we're going to be uh, talking about March March Madness at the end of sorry sorry March's Madness at yeah, the end of the yeah, show. Matt, get it right. I know, I know. Um, yeah. Uh, so so stick around because we're going to be going over the winners of the you know of the last round, and then Scott and I are actually going to be making our picks live. We haven't made our votes yet I know. for the uh, current round. I didn't plan on us both doing this, but uh, <laughs> you said it too, so we're, we're going with it. Yep. All right, let's move on into the chapters. We begin 12.f, of course, uh, using the naming scheme such that f comes after e. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, by, so by that, of course, you mean the alphabet. Right, and that was, I believe, love lost. Right, so okay. so in, in other words, the the all, all the cluster members. Actually, I don't think the I don't think the pattern has been perfectly um, consistent. Maybe, but anyway, the idea is that the cluster members are being marched through alphabetically, even though that sequence is happening across multiple um, arcs. Yeah, yeah. So at the end of the last chapter, Cradle touched his glasses. Uh, without putting them on, almost as if they were some kind of anchor for him. And here at the start of this interlude, he is taking off the glasses, holding them, using them as a reminder. Um, and what they are to him in this moment, in this flashback, are a reminder of a particular lesson, and that lesson is one of self-control 
patience and specifically not to throw tantrums. Yeah. And I think we talked about at the end of last chapter, this was one of those moments where you had read the chapter and I hadn't, but I, I really noticed that the the text really like wanted us to zoom in and focus on the moment where he reaches down to pick up his glasses before he starts to scream. And I, I, I thought that it was telegraphing um, and a symbolic importance here. And it turns out that this is absolutely the case. That is mm-hmm. what is, what is true throughout this entire chapter with cradle throughout um, all the changes and the decisions he's making um, the glasses and the, and the image of the glasses is kind of our binding on this chapter. Um, and, and it's like, it's, it's fun because you go back and you kind of think about the, I think the first time rain described cradle in the dream, he described him as a, a guy whose distinguishing feature was his glasses that were scratched up, right? They were mm-hmm. so scratched up that it didn't even look like he could see through them. And it, so it, it, it kind of, you know, makes perfect sense for this character that we've known kind of from afar for a while, but now we're, are learning uh, more about that. We start with this, this one key characteristic and and that's where everything begins. Yeah. The, the symbol of the glasses, uh, it does so many things in this chapter. It's, it's meaningful in in many different places and we're going to keep coming back to it for sure. Yeah. And that's, that's one of those things that I've, I've struggled with, um, with this book before. And and you and I were talking about this before we started recording. And I think you, you keyed me in on an important thing about this is I've struggled sometimes with some of the symbolism in this book is very overt. It's very like the book explains exactly what the symbol means. Um, and, and I, I struggle with whether or not I like that or not. And one of the things that you keyed me into here was, well, this is a symbol that's operating on multiple levels, right? It's operating on a a meta thematic level for us, the reader. We talk about the glasses. We talk about it as a a lens in which distorts things around it, Um, a thing that distorts light. It's it's an image we've been talking about throughout this entire book. But the reason why the symbol here seems very explicit is because it's a symbol to our main character. These glasses have symbolic meaning to us, the reader, but they also have symbolic meaning to our character. So, of course, our character, our very prag- pragmatic, our very cold, calculating character is going to be very upfront and obvious with what his symbol means to him. It makes perfect sense in the point of view of the character we have. And that's got me to a place where I'm like, OK, I get it now. I get I get why this symbol is, is so so straightforward and and kind of stated to the reader through that yeah. perspective. Yeah, we were we were reflecting on how we we have like objects in our in our lives that have meaning for us like it's a, you know a, a physical thing. We're not book characters, but but the object still represents something to us. Um, and you know the thing about this story is is especially Victoria, she's a very analytic protagonist. She's a very yeah. She, she's prone to to these like digressions of thought where, where she will think about the meaning of things. Um, so she's unusually likely to think about the, the, the symbolic meaning of, of objects. But on, on another level, I think there are symbols in the story. Like we frequently talk about the colors. We frequently talk about this idea of things that bend light and light as a symbol. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are, those are not things that Victoria explicitly thinks about as being, you know, meaningful to her, but, but they are, um, doing things in terms of how you, you know, read the story and, and, and see it. And, uh, uh we haven't decoded what these symbols mean, but, um, not but just I'm pretty yet. sure, yeah. I'm pretty sure we, I'm pretty sure we'll figure it out eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but speaking that to that, that symbolic glasses, I think it's important to kind of state what these, what these very clearly are both meta textually and then, uh, intertextually <laughs> within <laughs> within cradle's own understanding of his own symbol they are they the glasses serve as a tool to correct his view of the world because his natural view of things is not uh the right one it's a different one it's a skewed one and uh it's not correct as far as what everyone else sees there they serve as basically a mask that he puts on to become a person that sees things in that correct way and their existence is a constant reminder of that fact and and like you said he goes back to this constantly throughout this chapter ad- adjusting them touching them cleaning them and then of course his trigger event is is very important this this symbol of what happens to the glasses and and why it happens is so very important to everything um mm-hmm. I, I love this this blurriness that exists without the glasses without the mask without the the lens to normalize his view of the world right right um yep so the first segment of the cradle interlude follows ryan that's his name 
Ryan's manipulation of his homeroom teacher, Mrs. Parrish, and we begin to understand what kind of person he is immediately. All of his portrayals of emotion are calculated. We have stuff like, oh, he said he tried to look like he was digesting that. Everything is everything is a put on and, and he's considering how it's being received. Yeah. And I want to I want to talk a little bit about how the the chapter like structurally takes advantage of all this stuff, because we start with the glasses. Like we said, that's the first thing we do. The most important element for everything is the element we start with here. And then because we ended the last chapter with glasses, we know immediate that immediately this is cradle. The story doesn't actually specifically say it's cradle until very late in the story, but it also doesn't treat it as a reveal because the assumption is it's telegraphed it. You know, Ryan is cradle. Um, and, and so suddenly we know we're here and we know this is cradle, but we don't, and we know who cradle is in the future, but we don't know who cradle is in the past yet. And it's kind of slowly kind of dripping and dribbling these hints for us about what kind of person he is and what may be wrong with him. Um, and, and it does this through these really ingenious ways. Like you were saying, these like little, little beats about how he's not experienced emotions. They're just all performative. Um, and he's fully aware of that fact. And, and the thing I really like about it is there's a moment in this early chapter where you're not quite sure what to make of all this, because the way the chapter is constructed, Cradle builds a narrative around himself that makes him seem like the victim at first. Like he's talking about like, oh, Mrs. Parrish like deserves like I could I could really hurt her and she would deserve it. Um, and you don't know what it is that he's done. Like he's like the, the teachers have been riding him incessantly like they, they're unfair to him. They just like take pleasure in his misery. And you're like, wow, that's kind of fucked up. Of course, he's hiding the reason for all that, which is that he's been an absolute devil to everyone in the school the entire time. And he but but there's a moment in, in this chapter where you don't you don't quite know. Right. And and mm-hmm. and it's like it's I think it's playing off the fact that, you know, this is this is Cradle, but you don't know, like, is this a story of Cradle as uh, a guy who was like a put upon victim that that was thrown into this life or what is it going to be? And and you don't know that yet. And I think it, it helps like you go through this this early part of the chapter. Yeah, like the first half of this section, I was thinking, oh, the, the way Wildo is going to make me feel empathetic with this character is to show that he's been um, basically broken by, you know, teachers and, and authority figures. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I could probably sympathize with that. But but no, it's not it's not that actually he's he hasn't been broken. Uh, the only way in which perhaps you could say that he's been broken is that when he was basically a, a small kid, he threw a tantrum, broke his glasses and like basically faced a consequence of his yeah. lack of control. Right. And, and you know, that there are the glasses again showing that he loses something he really values when he throws a tantrum, he'd better, he'd better start playing the long game and this sticks with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and kind of the way the teacher, I, I'm blanking on her name right now, but the way the teacher, Ms. like Parrish. Ms. Parrish, thank you. Um, the way she kind of lectures him, like you can see a point of view that she, it's like that it, there's a way of, making things so that she's actually the bad one, right? Like that, like she's being a jerk. Like the, the, the karma symbol is I think very intentional because it is, it is a swastika a reverse mm-hmm. swastika rather, which is, you know, a, a Buddhist symbol. Um, but it also has very powerful imagery attached to it. Right. So like the fact that it's described by the text as a reverse swastika, knowing that it has that powerful imagery attached. I think this is, this is again, kind of manipulating you into maybe buying into cradles bullshit a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, maybe not everyone thinks the same way, but I'm like, why would a teacher wear such a provocative thing? Like, (laughs) like, like, you you know, that's going to cause a a stir. Right. 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 I mean, I I think that the truth in our world is that you just really can't do that anymore. Like the, the, the the Nazi symbol has taken over the meaning of that symbol. And, um, no, but maybe, maybe in this earth was the, when was the differentiating point? It was the eighties, right? So yeah. yeah, So there was definitely Nazis. Yeah. Well, cause there's all empire 88. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know. I think it's all part and parcel of the kind of manipulation that we're being, we're being thrown under in this early part of the chapter where we kind of, we kind of maybe very briefly tie into the, the, um, the cradle is the victim bullshit here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. 
So when his parents arrive, we come to understand that he has successfully roped his parents into being his enablers. Basically, his life is easier when they think he's an angel. Um, they're very eager to think that he's better. And so he behaves well for the sake of it, it like it, enlisting them as his defenders. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's critical to point out, and I think it's going to be pointed out consistently, that even though he doesn't have, you know, normal human empathy, he's still able to appreciate the value of having allies and friends. Yeah. But, but uh, still, at this point in his life, he's a purely manipulative evil shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially in his school life. And, and I think this, this is so, it's such a wonderful buildup because like we said, we've been talking about this thing where we, we have maybe been manipulated into believing cradle or seeing him as the victim. Ryan, I should stop saying cradle Ryan. We maybe bought into this bullshit a little bit. And then there's this one moment where, where I think wild Bo recognizes the importance of this, where they're walking out of the school and his dad turns to him and says, did you hurt that girl? And the response is, no, he lied with sincerity. And I think that is the moment when the chapter reveals the manipulation, when it, when it fully takes away the smoke screen and you fully start to see who and what Ryan is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a wonderful moment that you've kind of been baited into buying this. You kind of see maybe from his parents' point of view, you see Cradle as, as maybe he or they see him. Um, but then because we're in his point of view, we get to see that crumble and we know, we know exactly who he is. Yeah. And, and we don't find out for quite a while what he actually did, which I love right. as a, as a bit of like horror tone where you're like, Oh God, what did he do? And your imagination runs wild. Yep. <laughs> so later cradles a little bit older, I guess he's at a new school and he befriends uh, a girl, Amanda and another kid from his old life. Yeah, can we just talk a little bit about the befriending of Amanda, though? Because it's mm -hmm. like this, it's like this, I think, very specifically Victoria-esque examination of her clothes. And he also did this to Mrs. Parrish, right? It was this very targeted, specific, um, like, dress down of clothes as a method of uh, examining a person. Yeah, it's and, a detective type thing. Right, right. It's it, And of course, it makes sense for his character because he's this very detail-oriented guy. Um, he he reads into details and, and uses details to suss out information about people, uh, partially, I think, because his understanding of emotions is so skewed. But um, I, I don't think like I'm not saying like he's just like he's just like Victoria. I'm not saying that at all. Right. But it, it is I think it is very specifically like, oh, that's kind of what Victoria does, only like a nastier version of it. Right. Yeah. It's what Victoria does, but basically just aimed at figuring out how to destroy that person. Right. And and I don't like he uses like he sees he sees someone wearing poor clothes and um, he sees that as a person he can manipulate, a person he can control. Yeah. Um, and and which is not which is not quite the same thing as what Victoria says, even in her internal monologue when she does. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I think at this point. It'd be good to talk like at a higher level and a more abstract level about what Wildbo's doing with this character, mm -hmm. because this character is a clinical psychopath. And while he may not be the first Wildbo clinical psychopath character, he's definitely the one where we're given the most evidence that that's probably the correct diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's a kid who probably had like oppositional defiant disorder and he grows into a teenager who actually works hard to be something approaching unimpeachable, not because he cares about other people, but because he recognizes that his life is better if other people have no reason to despise him. And the text tells us from his point of view, it says he'd had to work for a long time now at every interaction, every project. And basically we're, we're, we're seeing that him, him being on his best behavior is difficult for him. Yeah. It is constant work for him, but he's still doing it because it's worth it to him. Yeah. And I really, I really love this because like it, it automatically takes you from a place where you're like this fucking little shit to where you're like, oh, I mean, he has a mental illness like mm -hmm. he, there his his brain does not work in a way that leads to empathy and emotional understanding and morality in the way we know it. So it's like you're immediately kind of put to a place where like. I'm no longer calling I'm no longer comfortable calling this kid, at least this version of him, a monster. Right. Mm -hmm. Because like I think that's it's unfair and dismissive. And like he's just someone who struggles with 
things that the rest of us don't struggle with. And he's undiagnosed. He's not on medication. He's just kind of alone to figure out all this out by himself. And um, he's trying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not even sure like what, what they do, what they can do for someone who is in his position from a clinical perspective, but, but, but regardless, yeah, I I agree with you. Like he didn't choose to be this way. Right. The the text is as clear as is possible that he was born this way. He's been like this since he was a baby. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's purely like originating from this one lesson involving, you know, his glasses where he learns, oh, I need to, I need to exert some control. And at first up like through the first, maybe half of this, of this chapter, maybe uh, that's a pretty rough estimate, but th- th- through the first half of things, he, he's thinking in terms of, I need to control myself so I can play the long game. Mm-hmm. And the long game is I get to get away with more fucked up things. If I, if I behave well. Yeah. And ev- eventually that ceases to be the game, but we'll, we'll see how that evolves over, over time. Yeah. And, and what I love about it is how the writing reflects that particular mm-hmm. change. Um, how, cradle's internal narrative adjusts as um the the mask that he puts on uh sits there for longer and longer and and Mm -hmm. as as those glasses literally change in their meaning for him in 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 their purpose for him it's it's so clever it's so wonderful it's this like it's this wonderfully like poetic through line of this chapter that just you know, m- makes everything work. It makes everything work. You said this is one of your favorite Wild Blood chapters, and I kind of agree. Like, I think everyone lost their minds about twelve dot all, um, and I like that one a lot too. But this is this is this is interludes for me, man. This is what I love about these things. They're this like this contained, you know, rhyming story almost. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love that. Yeah, I mean, I I just it can focus on this one character and and right. this one character while being. A bit, a bit inhuman is not as inhuman as uh, the alien shards. So yeah. So under the surface, at this point, Ryan still gets some level of enjoyment out of fucking with people and getting away with things, particularly fucking with people who have wronged him in, in his mind. Um, so in this first interaction with Amanda and Lloyd, we see hints of this flickers showing through the cracks. Uh, stuff like um, he passes a note to Lloyd. And it says, other students pass notes saying something like, do you like Sarah? Y slash N. The note Lloyd got was simpler. Ernie, Joseph, Miss Butler, Christina, Lloyd too. Y slash N. <laughs> this is so delightfully horrible. Like uh-huh. it, it's so, it's, it's simple, it's juvenile and still absolutely monstrous. And I, and I love, I love Ryan's viewpoint on this because like, this is introducing this concept of fair, right? Like this is one besides the glasses. One of the other things that, that was introduced at the very beginning of this chapter and kind of carries us all through it is this idea of fairness of karma of do bad and bad will happen to you do good and you will be rewarded for it. And in his mind, he's been good. He's been patient. He's been making friends. He's been holding back. He's been behaving. He's been doing the work. And here comes this, this surprise element and someone from his old life that's going to screw it all up for him. And it's not fair. And I'm going, so he lashes out in, uh, the, in the way that Ryan does in a very like evil, manipulative, terrifying way. Mm -hmm. He, he does, he does lash out, but it's, it's, what I would call a, a controlled way of lashing sure, out, yeah. where it, it it results in kind of the best possible outcome, which which is Lloyd just basically immediately saying, "You're not going to have a problem with me. Don't worry about it." <laughs> yeah, the best possible outcome being he just scared this poor child to death. Right. Ex- yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and and I think it's important to note that um in, in these moments where he's considering doing this and working towards doing this and kind of waiting for his scheme to pay off, he's not wearing the glasses. He takes them off and he's like under the guise of cleaning them, is what the text says. It's like these moments where he's like most closely acting upon his innate desires. He's not even wearing them anymore. It's not just an adjustment or a reminder they're there. He has to hold them in his hands. It's a more pressing, more immediate reminder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting because I would be tempted to read that as uh, he's taking them off so that he he's taking off the mask. Right, right. But that's that's not really what it is. It's it's more exactly like you said. He's 
he's holding them with his hands, which is yet, <laughs> which is another important thing that's going to fold into yeah. all this is, is that he's he's someone who manipulates the world, but what he, what ends up happening to the, to him is he, he gets basically a fundamentally a manipulator shard. Yeah. And and the 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 MO of the shard is via like hands, pseudopods, tentacles or whatever. Right. Um so so the hands are obviously going to be key too. So him putting the glasses in his hands is a great way of connecting those two symbols. Yeah, and fantastic. What I, and what I like about it um it, it, I think like you said it's not it, it is him, I think, taking off the mask, but it is not him removing the mask. It's like he's he's kind of trying to have best of both worlds where he takes off the mask briefly to do this thing. But also it's still right there in his hands. So mm-hmm. um, he doesn't go too far. It's still controlled and contained um, in a way that we're going to see later is not quite. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So in the next section, we see signs that Ryan is changing further. Um, so what what's happened now is time has passed. He's actually become friends with these two other kids and he has done something really bad. He has stolen a cat and in my reading, he has stolen a cat and left it to die in a cage. Um, and <laughs> I still think that's the right reading, um, but, yeah. but I'm not entirely sure. I, I don't and, know. Yeah. And, and he's done this as an act of revenge against against an old teacher, which is basically the kind of thing that motivated him before. Right. Um, but he stopped himself from going further than this in, in his own in his own words. Um, and now he's telling his friends about this. And it's all it's a fascinating kind of calculated vulnerability because he's not he's not telling them because he cares about them, but He's telling them because he wants to change. He's telling them as, as a kind of commitment device. He's basically saying, this is what I am. Keep an eye on me because I don't, I don't want to get into these situations, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're going to say a little bit later like that he's, he's going out of his way to break the illusion of who he is to these people. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very interesting choice on his part. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this innate desire for him to be seen, not just through the lens that uh, he has been seen before, but but to be judged as the person he is by these people around him, and yeah, to to be kept in a check, or 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 to be rightfully judged as who he is, or just or just this desire, you know, maybe to to for people to acknowledge the hard work he's been putting in, and um, these very I think human desires. Yeah, that's one thing that I love is that Wildbo finds ways to make us connect with this character. He doesn't have empathy. Sure. But he does have a, a lot of other human emotions. Yeah. And so you, you can still connect with him. You can empathize with him, even though he can't empathize with other people, over the idea of like putting in a lot of work um, into changing and being better. Yeah. And and feeling like you've built this, um, you know, you've, you've built something, you've accomplished something, and then something comes along to threaten that thing you've built. That that That's something where you can feel for him, even yeah. though another part of you sees him as, as monstrous. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, and I think one of the things that the, the, this whole cat, um, part does a really good job of is using that kind of well-trod serial killer trope. Um, like the torturing of animals is like the thing that, Oh, this is what, this is what leads to serial killers, right? Like psychopaths start out torturing animals and then they move on to humans a little bit later. Um, and this is, this is the road. And I think like we're, we're we're going down this very familiar path with Ryan, um, but we are seeing him step back. And that's where I think like I struggle with with your read about, OK, yeah, he didn't drown the cat, but he did just leave it in the cage until it starved to death, um, because that kind of damages what I think the, the the importance of the holding back is. So I don't I don't I don't know. Like I, I read it multiple times and he definitely says he just left it under a tree. Um, right. in the cage still. So I mean, maybe someone came along and saw it there. I don't, I don't know. Um, the text does not tell us, but, um, yeah, that's possible. Right. Or it's possible that even he let it out later cause it takes a while for an animal to starve. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but to me, I mean, this is like, this is, this is very specifically channeling that imagery, but stepping back from it. And so it's like, like this is the path he's going to, torture animals he's going to move on to people and that's his future and then the text almost says well no hold on he's gonna stop it he's gonna find a way to stop it and 
um, he's going to find a way to turn back. And Mm -hmm. and that is, I think, incredibly important towards the the entire journey of this character. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. There's, you know, like, for example, like you were saying, he, he's really gratified that Lloyd thinks he's better, uh, he, even though Amanda doesn't seem convinced. Yeah. But it, he, he's gratified because it means that he's successfully tricked people into thinking he's normal. Um, but yeah, like like you said, he, he's not making he, he, he's making sure that his friends realize that he's not normal, that, you know, he's going out of his way to break this illusion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just like we said, I think that's very telling that, that he makes that choice. He did not have to do that. And, and as a person who, as we'll see a little bit later is kind of obsessed with social currency of every interaction, um, every, everything he does for one of his friends or or someone in his life, he feels like he needs to get something in return for it. Um, this seems to be the opposite of that. This, this seems to be a, a move on his part that, from a purely like cold, calculated, rational perspective doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think that's important to uh, the recognition of of how he is growing and changing as a person, even if he is faking it, which he is like he is faking this. He does not feel warm. He does not like these people like you and I like being around people. It is different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And he um, did still almost drown a cat. <laughs> like he did. Yeah. He did. He did do that. Right. It, it, it is this very interesting thing that we've seen, you know, we've we've hinted at this idea many times in the story is that like you kind of become the mask that you wear. Mm-hmm. The shards kind of become the masks that they wear via via the humans they occupy. Um, and, and yeah, he's doing something that from a like coldly rational, like like Android perspective it is is an irrational move. Like he's he's tipping his hand when he doesn't have to. Mm-hmm. And and like we said, it's because. He's kind of drawing them into his world, but he's also using them to draw him into their world. Um, so I wanted to talk about this exchange here, yeah, where uh, Amanda doesn't believe that he's that he's changed, and she says, "Better, you were going to drown a cat." Amanda raised her voice, but I didn't. I stopped there, decided it wasn't worth the hassle. I don't get anything out of it, and the hassle if I get caught. That's not a good reason. You're religious, aren't you? You do what you do because of God and heaven and fear of hell, uh, which is just really funny because a lot of people say that that's why they do things, but ultimately it's not. But it's it's funny that a psychopath would think that that's why people do things. Yeah, I think you're right, and, and I really I really love this interaction because Amanda does not take this well, um, and I admit, like in in their discussion of Ryan. I saw a bit of you and I's past discussions about this concept of morality and free will and how these things interconnect and, and the, the, the disagreements we've had about this in the past. And, uh, these are discussions when I, th- which I think you have unquestionably won because you say, <laughs> uh, blah, 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 blah. And my response is, yeah, but I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like it. Ergo. No. Yeah. Um, and, right. and, and this is, I mean, I think this is like, we're talking about how human, Ryan's reaction to thing are sometimes things are sometimes. I think Amanda's reaction is very human too. I think it's like it, it makes a lot of extent, sense for you to kind of instinctually go, "You only murdered that cat because it was too much of a hassle, not because it was wrong." It makes sense for you to hear that and be like, "Well, that's not good." Um, and I think there's a version of myself that had that initial reaction, right? That's like, "Oh, well, your motivations for this were not because it." it was bad, but just because you just didn't feel like doing it. Um, that's not a good sign, but I think that's the, the danger of that and what, what, uh, Amanda is doing here. And, and again, she's a kid too. And I think she's not fully equipped to deal with a person who has Ryan's mental illness. Um, you're judging his brain against a, a standard and a system that works entirely differently than his. Like, The question is, and I think the question that this chapter poses many times is, does it matter why he didn't kill the cat as long as he didn't kill the cat? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. If if anything, if you don't feel bad when you hurt people, but you still manage to to not hurt people, isn't that more impressive? (laughs) Like, who cares if who cares what reasons you had to cook up? Isn't it more impressive that you manage to control yourself despite the fact that you have no 
inner locus of of moral feeling that's compelling you. I kind of, I kind of like that because it ties back into the last chapter, the chapter before this one, where Victoria and Rain were talking about um, how feeling bad about feeling good about doing bad things to people um, is part of how you measure yourself against going too far. And yeah. and then we have this character, this character here who literally cannot do that. They do not yeah. have that measurement device. It does not exist on them. Yeah. And they didn't choose to be that way either, which right. I think is worth repeating. Right. Right. Yeah. And right. I, I, go ahead. No, I just, I just love how we, we continue this, this cat killing metaphor through the dress that he made her. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, this, this moment, like, she needed a dress for the dance. She couldn't afford it. Ryan goes to his mom, learns how to sew, gets her help for the hard parts. Um, he doesn't finish a dress on time because it's too complicated. He even misses her birthday, um, but he still makes it for her eventually. He admits that he didn't feel warm about this at all. This didn't make him feel good, um, but he told himself it was laying the groundwork for something later. And I love I love that he told himself thing because that's a very loaded phrase, right? That, that, that implies that it is kind of a self convincing moment where like almost as if he's acting irrationally against his normal measurement of transactions, um, but is trying to justify something he doesn't understand about himself in a way he can understand. So it's like, well, I I must be doing this because um, I'm going to, exchange this for some social currency later like that's the only reason why i would be doing this otherwise it doesn't make sense to me yeah i mean just to take a stab at it i think the real reason is closer to like it actually bothers him that he can't convince her that he's better and 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 that's just again it's not a warm fuzzy thing it's it's a man i really want to like win right but 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 like it's really hard to fault him for wanting to win at convincing someone that he's a good person. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, especially because he's not he's not thinking like I want to convince her that I'm a good person so that I can manipulate her into a situation where I can <laughs> do something really horrible to her. Like that's right. That's nowhere in this chapter. He he probably even even like the good version of, of Ryan uh, that we're going to see, you know, closer to the middle. Um would probably still go after someone who they who he felt had wronged him. Yeah. But so would like a mentally healthy person. <laughs> so True, true. Yeah. Um, well, and 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 the thing that I really like about the the capstone on this section of the chapter is at, at the end of it when we see he just like you're just like, "Oh, he made her a dress. That's mm-hmm. so nice. It's something she really care like that's so nice. It and it really is. It's such a nice thing to do for someone and it, and it almost doesn't matter that he didn't do it just because it was nice. He was convincing himself that he did it for a specific transactional reason. But then we have this moment where he realizes that the reason why she's not called Manny anymore, the reason why everyone calls her Amanda now is because he was subtly manipulating that away because he didn't like Manny. He didn't like mm-hmm. it. It's a stupid name for a girl, he said in his mind. And he arrange things to move away from that. So, so while the, the story keeps us firmly like in this world of, yeah, he's doing these things and he's making progress, but like there's still part of him that is this person. It is still there. Even as, even in all this work, you can't, you can't get rid of that part of yourself entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think that the chapter does a fantastic job of not, going too far in the direction of saying like isn't he just such a good guy like (laughs) no he's not right um but but still let's give a guy credit where credit is due sure yeah that 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 i think is is the fine balance that that this chapter maintains sure i i i totally agree with that yeah um so very suddenly um we take a a hard right turn into shardland (laughs) And we meet a grasping self, this motherfucker. <laughs> this uh, motherfucker. So here here comes the last thing Ryan needs, a completely inhuman, cold, alien mind fixated on controlling and manipulating the environment, completely self-oriented and resentful of any imposition, sidling up to him and uh, poisoning his brain. Yeah, it's it was a uh, unexpected swerve. I was not expecting this. I had I had a good idea of what this chapter was going to be and what it wasn't. And jumping into a shard point of view was not what I expected. But uh, I'm so glad it's here. I, I really am. Like I think structurally, it comes at this wonderful point in the story where we're like, it's almost like 
a pause, um, a pause at a moment of what seems like progress to just remind everyone that's reading, oh, look what's coming. Mm -hmm. You know, because because we have to remember that we we know this character's end story. We know where they end up for all the progress we've been watching them make. We know what's waiting for them. And it is grasping self. That is what's waiting for them. Mm -hmm. Um, And just like the, the shard is so delighted at finding this person that is just like him. And it's just Mm -hmm. like, fuck you. Yeah. Right. This is probably the best possible like trajectory (laughs) this kid can be on given his, given his starting conditions and you're just going to rip the rug out from under him. Going to go fuck it up. Yep. I want to draw attention to the fact that almost every time it's a a grasping self. Not, you know, the grasping self or grasping self. It's a grasping self. Yeah. Like that's like another degree of dissociation or distance. Like even even Scion was the entity. Yeah. Um which which at least the gives you a sense of like, oh yeah, it's the it's the character whose head we're in a, a, a grasping self is just like an almost like a being narrating its own existence without any sense of identification with itself yeah I, which I th- is really weird and disconnected right yeah it is and and that's like this is the third shard point of view we've had now matt um mm-hmm. in this story and therefore three is enough to start to make judgments about what the shards are um and how they they normally operate. And what we've seen is three shards that are entirely different from each each other. Right. So like, so we were wondering like, is Victoria's shard, the outlier and March's shard, the way they both, they normally are is March's shard, the outlier and Victoria's the way they normally are. And what we found now between these three is that they're all kind of different, like people. They're not like there's not like they have a, an underlying set programming that we will talk about a little bit. But um, no one shard is like another. Yeah, I mean, like for example, grasping self spends months giving Ryan these weird dreams, kind of like prepping him, I guess, yeah. well in advance of the actual trigger event. And what's notable in, in all that is that it sees Ryan as the assistant. It's not. It's kind of like a partner, like like uh, Waste sees Victoria. Yep. It's it, it, it doesn't see Ryan as like a cute little thing that it can help. <laughs> it's not not a cute little bunny that it nope. can help. Nope. It's a Ryan is the shard's subordinate. It it's he Ryan is is the shard's assistant. Yeah. It's <laughs> the 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 shard is not Ryan's power. Ryan is the shard's vessel yep I, I love that i love that and i like i like this idea of him fucking with him with dreams right um this is like i don't know if we had known that shards do this in the past mm-hmm. have we i don't think so i I think only recently only as of 12 dot all did we even realize that the shards would like ride people around prior to uh triggering right yeah yeah, and and just like this, this this kind of the ins, the insidiousness the insidiousness of it to like find a willing host and then to just sit around and be just like, oh, I'm just waiting for my moment. Oh, any moment it's gonna come here, and I'm just gonna do it. And his worst fucking day, I'll be here. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I just it's like ugh, I hate it, I hate it, I hate, it. I hate this fucking shard. I know it. It is my least favorite shard so far that we've met. <laughs> well, well, good. <laughs> Um, yeah. So in the mall, Ryan is mulling over his sincere disappointment that Lloyd has pulled away from him and he's trying to earnestly cultivate a friendship with Amanda. Um, at this point, it's not about Amanda. It's about winning this abstract game of showing that he can control himself and that he can work to have real allies. Yeah. Um, so I guess we should say this is the, yeah, we've jumped forward. This is post gold morning. Um, this is, this is the day of the trigger. Um, and I, when, when I first read you write, read what you wrote here, I, I wanted to push back against it. Um, I, I wanted to be like, no, I, you're, you're wrong. I, I don't, I don't see it's like him just still playing the game. I think he's, he, this is, he's changed. And I, and I pulled all this evidence. So look how he's changed. Like at this moment where he says, um, Lloyd had pulled away, recoiled even. Did that make the friendship not a friendship? It was a depressing thought, understandable, but depressing. 
And 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 I, I like I was like, look at this. Look, look at the way he describes himself. He seems more in tune with emotions, more in, like his, his internal narrative has shifted and changed. What he's thinking about has shifted and changed. And I was like, no, that's so he's not playing the game anymore. He's actually changed. And then I realized that, no, it's just the game has shifted. Um, we see in this moment where he's internalized the glasses metaphor, right? The tick mm-hmm. had evolved. It was less about actions now and then focus on better things, he told himself. So the glasses used to be a tick to remind himself not to do something. Don't act on this. You, you want to fuck over this person. Don't do it. You want to kill this cat. Don't do it. Now it's don't think like that. Now it's do, like he's, he's been wearing this mask for so long that it's not just actions, it's thoughts. And we're seeing that reflected in how the story is telling this part of the, the, the story mm-hmm. uh, that he has internalized to a level where his internal narrative isn't doing the things that the internal narrative we saw of Ryan earlier in the chapter was doing. Now it has changed. It is, it is less cold, less calculating. And, and I don't think it is that way because Ryan suddenly feels these emotions. Now that's not it. He's just gotten so good at pretending that the line between acting and reality has blurred. And it's, that's reflected in the writing. And I love that so much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you're right. And, and I might even go a, a, a little bit in, the, in, in your direction and say, like, he doesn't feel warm feelings when he thinks about his friend Amanda in the same way that you or I feel warm feelings about our right. friends. But he does feel good feelings about the thing that he has cultivated between them and yeah. his success in that. And, and yeah, it's not the, it's not the same thing, but it's, it's damn closer than he would have had if he hadn't put this much work into it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's one of the big, the, if, if you tell yourself for years that I do X, I'm supposed to feel Y, how long until your brain just maps, I'm supposed to feel Y to your internal story just is that it is you feeling that like the emotion doesn't exist. Right. But mm. if your brain tells itself that it does. Yeah. Doesn't it? It's like cognitive behavioral therapy, basically. Right. right. I mean, not, not formally, but he's basically trained himself to have a certain loop. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I agree. So he notices the fallen army come in, although he doesn't realize that's what they are. He does kind of detect danger imminent. Um, but instead of leaving like he's inclined to, he he prioritizes buying gifts for his for his loved ones. <laughs> and the thing that I love about it is his justification is never the gifts. It's a uh, well, I need clothes, right? Mm-hmm. I need clothes. But we the first thing that he does when he gets in the mall is he does he go and get his clothes? No, he, he goes to the bookstore first and he waits in line for enough to drink almost like to drink a full coffee and have a snack to get the books. So while he's saying, I really need clothes. The only reason I'm here is I need clothes. The first thing he does is buy the book for himself and then buy the presents for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, what I love about the, uh, the shift here is that we don't see him transactionalize the gifts. Like he doesn't say, Oh, this is for Amanda. I will give her this because Um, I can cash this in for this or because like that is just not present in the narrative or in his internal narrative at all. Like it's, Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's nothing about like a specific reason for why, for why he can see rationally the benefit of buying these gifts for people. He just does it. He just does it. He sees things that he thinks someone would like and he buys it. And that I think goes into this general idea of, of faking it until you make it. And, and that's kind of what we're seeing in Ryan right here. Yeah, I mean, I don't even spontaneously buy gifts for friends very often. <laughs> uh, and, and so it, it's kind of a, it's like, wow, he's, he, he's, he's made it. He's, he's like made himself into a good person. This is amazing. And yeah. it's so sad that we know that he's at the, at the mall. We know exactly what's going to happen. Yep. It's, and, you know, before that, he looks, he sees an old, an old married couple. He says, like Amanda and Lloyd, but 10 years older, an old couple. Is there any way I get that? Any way that's fair to whoever I end up with? Ugh. 
the, the the tragedy in this moment is in the the implication that that, that he wants it on some level yeah. or or at least his 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 pretending has told him that he wants it right um, right he sees Amanda and Lloyd as a married couple he sees this old couple and he wants that but yeah. some part of him knows or believes that he can't and well ugh. yeah I mean it's it's even again it's like it's heartbreaking because like if he were if he were the way he had been before then he would just be like yeah I could probably get that if yeah. I wanted yeah I could manipulate would, my way into a relationship yeah right he wouldn't spare a thought for the idea of whether it was fair for another person yeah true that, that's very that, true that's that's something that he's had to cultivate and 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 it's interesting because we see this manifestation of his his sense that fairness should exist and and he has extended that fairness to other people right it's yeah. not just it's not just a constant awareness of whether things are fair to him it's would that be fair to some hypothetical other person yeah totally and uh then you know the fire starts uh, here we go and and he and an old man near him is knocked down and again it's not about the old man it's about being true to all of this hard work that he's put in and and it says he couldn't say why he'd helped habit or because this when all was said and done couldn't be the point where people would turn around and call him a monster he'd worked hard played fair played nice shaken and rebuilt friendships and shaken and rebuilt family he knew this wouldn't change that not now but it's, he still made sure the old man was secure on his feet before he pushed forward trying to get through before the way became too packed yeah and and this is the central idea right of how long does pretending to be a certain certain type of person just become being that type of person um because yeah he how long before pretending to be a person that helps an old man up is just being a person that helps an old man up like what is the difference there at the end of the day what is the difference the old man still gets helped up right right he still put himself at risk to do it yep yeah yeah and and, and he's not cured right like psycho psychopathy is not a curable mental illness right like it's it's your brain is different um but he has through techniques and and mechanisms and work has approximated a good person so efficiently that it is indistinguishable from a good person yeah i mean this is really the this character is the perfect like softball pitch for the free will discussion because it's like <laughs> right he he didn't he didn't choose to be this way he didn't choose to 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 have these issues um and so you can't really blame him no. for for the things that are wrong with him um but but then can you blame him for for <laughs> do you give him credit for trying to be better where do you where do you assign credit where do you assign blame it's it's a it's a fantastic like little case study of knocking our intuitions on their side uh, and making us like reconstruct all of them from scratch. Uh, and it's yeah. not easy. No, it, it, and it shouldn't be. And that's what I love about it. Yeah. So ultimately he's knocked down. His glasses are stepped on. They're scratched up. The symbol of, of his, of his rules of, of his lesson is, is being destroyed. And in, in his attempt to grab it, his hands, the symbol of manipulating and controlling the world are crushed, stepped on bleeding, and then he reaches up for help and the worst possible thing answers. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I, I love I love that. The we have this idea like the, at the very beginning, the most important thing about the glasses and his lesson from the glasses were this was my fault. I broke the glasses. Because of my behavior. And it was a, it was, it was, it was a lesson in responsibility and change and, and moving towards being a, a person who wouldn't let that happen again. And, and we see he's put in the work. He's done what he needs to do. He's tried to become a better person. So, so much so that, that he is, and this time the glasses are broken, that, 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 that mask is taken away from him, but it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his action that did this. It wasn't his choices that resulted in that consequence. This is someone else's bad choice, someone else's monstrous action. But his glasses are still broken again. And he yeah. puts them on one last attempt to wear the mask and finds that he can't see anything through them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's not fair. Nope. Right. It's, it's not. It's fair. absolutely not fair. And that's that's the. 
the major tragedy of the whole thing is he didn't he didn't deserve this, right? No. Nope. I mean, I mean, well, <laughs> from here it's easy to be mad at the guy, <laughs> but at this moment, it's hard not to feel for him. Sure. So I just love the shard. And I mean, what I mean is I hate the shard, uh, but I love this language here. I love this writing, this whole this whole paragraph. Build, blind liar. Lie, build, and build lies. Reach and grasp. We are broken now. We cannot take away your knowledge, but we will function as a perfect pair because we are both dead inside, disconnected. So... Fuck this shard. It's a. Um, uh, uh, it's it gets a little poetic there, Mr. Yeah. Shard. He's just a yeah. little poet there. Build blind liar lied. Build and build lies. It's like right. he's there's there's a rhyme to it. There's yeah. a, a, a a meter to it. Yeah, there, it's it's um, it's um, what's what's the word? I mean, it's almost like it's it's intentionally crafting these words to to be poetic, right? Yeah, because it's like taking so much pleasure. Yeah. in this moment. This right, thing it right. was waiting for. But I love like blind, blind liar. He's blind because he doesn't have his glasses. He's going to build, he's going to build lies now. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, a, a grasping self is psyched that it has found somebody like it, somebody dead and manipulative like it is. But then it gets undercut. Oh, it's not fair, Scott. It's not <laughs> fair. <laughs> grasping self put in so much work cultivating this person and now an anguished heart appears, another shard that has ridden its host and watched and learned, a shard with a detailed map of human emotion. Who cares about that? Who cares about human emotion? Yeah. Um, grasping self is super annoyed about this, but but he's obligated to make the connection once requested. Yeah, I, I love this detail, this carefully laid plan that's it's thrown off and this obligation to programming. Um, we see here like how little agency and control the shards actually have, right? They're kind of slaves to a root program that they cannot change. They only can w- re- exist within this this program, this idea. Like the even if they don't want to do it, they don't have a choice. Yeah, right. I mean, I immediately, well, not immediately, but pretty pretty quickly was was actually was fixated by this idea and couldn't help digging into the idea of like you know the, the a lot there's a lot about like human connection and relationships in this story and what we learn here about the shards is that they can't refuse a connection um and, and it just got me thinking about like the nature of of human relationships and you know yeah we we, we can refuse a connection um we can refuse someone yeah. offering uh, a, a connection to us, but right. but um, but in some in some cases we kind of can't. Like, what is a family if not people who are connected to you despite what you may wish? <laughs> are you saying and, that um, this this uh, new shard, uh, anguished heart, is like Carol going like, "Hey, meet your sister. Uh huh. Meet meet your sister." It, yeah, your sister is uh she she's worried about you. Yeah. And and you're obligated to uh to talk to her uh, because we're family. I mean, and and I, I think I think the shards all the shards are are a big a big old family, right? Yeah. That's yeah. They're they're literally one organism on on one on one framing. Um so yeah, that's uh I I I felt like there was a lot buried in that in that concept that they couldn't refuse a connection once requested. Yeah. Um so yeah, I, I love that. And then, and then two more <laughs> deadbeat shards approach. We've got a lurching intruder who is an accident, a scrapling, which is apparently a word made up by Waldo. Huh. Um, which is pretty awesome because it's an awesome word. And uh, it, basically, this shard is just fallout from the detonation of a of, of a blast, uh, probably. So I mean, basically, this is this is Snag's mover shard, and it's yeah. probably like debris from Scion's death. Maybe that was my interpretation. I don't know if that's exactly right, but yeah, uh, it's, I think that works. Yeah, and then we have a cloven stranger. Uh, once again, grasping self is very poetic and gives all these poetic names. Cloven stranger, uselessness that saps a grasping self's power through its involvement. <laughs> a bud of a more powerful shard. Poor rain. Even a shard sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's just, it's funny to me how, like, 
uh, grasping self is just so like superior yeah. and, and, and just like despises these other shards for being a burden on it. Yeah. I love like, like he hates the, the fourth one specifically because it's a fourth no, and it's yeah. like, it's just like, it's like, it's, it's not like there's anything significant to, f- to there being four, but it's just like, I hate each one of you more, the more <laughs> of you there are. And here's number fucking four. And I'm so <laughs> mad about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is a disaster, right? Yeah. So a grasping self, like a true psychopath, manipulates the other shards into an arrangement that will favor itself and its assistant. It knows that Ryan can manipulate dreams, so it chooses dreams as the domain of, of communication. Uh, it knows that Ryan is particularly good at managing emotions, so it makes emotions a big part of the cluster gimmick. Um, it's basically, it's all part of a negotiation, but a grasping self is strong, manipulative, and self-oriented and so it just kind of creates the whole thing to fuck over the others yeah like uh like shardy like the servant yeah (laughs) so um next they're in the dream room that's we're skipping to the dream room it's like day six i believe Um, they're only beginning to realize that the dreams are going to keep cycling and rain has started to break down uh his facade is cracking as he realizes that being a good soldier won't even help him with the fallen Um, he offers his tokens and Ryan agrees to take Rain's tokens. But when he wakes up, his thoughts take an unaccustomed turn and he thinks about how it will hurt his friends to let them believe he's dead. And this immediately causes him to connect with the fact that snag shards also made him feel bad in in a different way. And he realizes the hidden gimmick of the tokens. Oh man, I love this so much, Matt. I love how this is written. Like, Like in his silence, hearing word from his mother about where he'd been going last... They'd concluded that he died. That, until this whole situation resolved, would be for the best. Except his hand touched his heart. It hurt. Upset welled in him, that upset finding new angles and sides, his thoughts of how they might feel at his death raced through his mind. This is structured and organized, Matt, to land with as much emotional impact as possible. I don't know why, but the detail to like to, to cut at accept but then hold the it hurt until after he gra- he grabbed his heart. He grabs his heart first. It's as if to say, like, he's this emotion is so foreign and so uncertain that before he even processes what it feels like, he touches the place that it feels first. And I just think that detail is just so perfect at conveying the shock at at feeling this thing that he's never felt before. And I love that sentence that you pulled out. I'm really glad that you drew my attention to it, that the... Uh Upset welled in him, that upset finding new angles and sides as thoughts of how they might feel at his death raced through his mind. Yeah. That's that's such a perfect way of saying, like, as if explaining to an alien, this is what it feels like when you feel bad about the the ramifications yeah. of something that you've done. Yeah. It's like your your mind serves up to you all kinds of new angles and sides um <laughs> on on the thing that you've done. Yeah. So let's before we move on, let's take a sec here and talk about Cradle's decision from this point. Right. That he he had built this person um, and then things happened that were unfair. And he basically decided to abandon the work he had done to reject the, the good person that he had built himself up to be, because what's the point? Right. Um, he is a he is a transactional based person who just came to the, the true, the ugly, true realization that there's no such thing as karma, that doing good doesn't mean good will be done to you, that sometimes bad things happen for no reason at all. And his response to that is to reject it all, to say, fuck it, and uh, to embrace the Ryan we saw at the very beginning of this chapter. So at this point, did you feel at all like maybe he was just gonna kill all of his cluster mates get get a handle on the situation and then try to go back to you know working on the on the self that he was building or do you feel like this is just a permanent um a p- permanently giving up on that i think up until the moment where he felt the feelings i think maybe in the back of his mind that's what he was thinking that I would deal with this, then go back to the way things were. Um, but I think 
I think he made a choice here. I think like the glasses are scratched. He can't rebuild them. That's one of the things that his tinker power won't give him the knowledge to remake the glasses and get glasses that work and can and can do their function again, can be their mask, can give him that lens on the world again. That is gone now. His ability to attempt to look through that lens and to see the world the way that everyone else does doesn't exist anymore. And um, and, and I think that brings us to this this idea of uh, this idea that. He he chose to better himself. He chose to become a person that wasn't a guy who drowns cats. That wasn't a guy who kills and manipulates and controls people. He chose to become the best version of himself. And then a bad thing happened. Did he choose to reject that idea? Did he choose to become the person that chops people up into bits? Um, just, uh, just for the fun of it or just to manipulate them or just to fuck with them. Did he choose that? Yeah, I don't know. Right. I mean, that's that's I, I don't I don't know if that has an answer. Right. I, I kind of go up to the level of like, I don't know if there is a coherent answer to that. Like he didn't he he didn't choose to be this way in the first place. Right. Um. So, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think I really don't think there is an answer, but it's it's to to repeat myself, it's it does a wonderful job at at making all of our normal um pre-prepared like cached explanations of well yes the, the person x is responsible for y because of reason z that i have that i have meticulously nailed down through right. my life as a human it's like no none of that applies to this individual yeah so you have to think it through from something like first principles or realize that your way of thinking about this just doesn't it, it isn't really consistent like, yeah, it, it can't be applied to a person who is that different from you. And and none of this is to be said. None of this is to say that he should not be stopped. Right. Like, like right. this is this is an entirely different conversation. Exactly. Then um, should he be killed? Should he be eliminated? Should he be removed from the board? That it's, it's totally different um, because the answer to that, I think, is obvious. It's yes. yes. Like you yes. cannot allow a person like this to continue to do the things that they're doing. Yes. If a, if a lion is attacking you. You don't say, well, that's just its nature. It's a carnivore. <laughs> yeah. it, you you fight it. Right. Um, right. Try to escape. And uh, that's kind of how I see the situation, actually. Like, yeah, yeah. that's th that's his nature. Um, it's a shame. Probably got to put him down. Yeah. But I, I do I do see a side of this where he showed that it was possible to overcome it. Yeah. And now we see a, a version of himself that is not interested in doing that anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so so I, I, I love the way this is done, though, because it's basically saying you have this person who's who's created this meticulous way of governing themselves. And then suddenly suddenly you hit them with really strong, bad feelings they've never felt before. Mm -hmm. And like just a rational being in this situation is going to say oh my god this this is horrible <laughs> i'm going to do everything i can to stop feeling these feelings mm -hmm. seems like the most efficient path to doing that is to kill all these other people who are making me feel this way sure <laughs> <laughs> and which i mean like that that's from from the point of view of of someone with the kind of mind he has it makes perfect sense right mm -hmm. like yeah it sucks <laughs> it yeah. sucks but it makes perfect sense sure 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 but i mean i like i don't he has he has the a method to which nobody with his mental illness has ever had before, right? He has a method yeah. of gaining empathy. That's um, true too. Yeah. So, but he doesn't want it. He doesn't want empathy. <laughs> that's right. That's, but isn't that bad? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I like how we're having a detail oriented conversation here. Um, but I don't know. I don't think we're going to be able to solve the problem. Right. Right. I, I don't. Um, I, yeah. I, I think I'm positing these questions knowing that there is not yeah, yeah. a clear answer to them. Well, I, I think they're great. I think they're great questions. And I'm 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 more thinking out loud than like answering, I think. But yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Let's move on. So though, cause we've let's been move taking on. Yeah. Time. So, um, yeah. In the present, he wakes up. His mind is recoiling 
from some of the things he had done recently. He's feeling almost as bad as if he'd been the victim. Yeah, that's new. Um, I, I love the contrast between this moment and the one we just saw, though. We just had this moment where he touches his hand to his heart and it hurt. And now in this moment, he he, where it was just a hurt, uh, just a pain in his heart before. Now it's pain lurched indistinct in his chest cavity, bitter, black, self-loathing. I love that. Also, like <laughs> he basically doesn't want to say it's coming from his heart. Like it, it, just this idea of indistinct chest uh-huh. like in, it's indistinct in his chest cavity it's like i'm not like my heart doesn't hurt i just feel this pain this indistinct pain in this general heart like region uh-huh yeah i, <laughs> I like just that. i just like the detail of it it's yeah. so good that's great um but you know lucky for him he's really strong now uh he succeeded in draining love lost and colt and although he's filled with self-loathing and doubt it won't stop him from executing his plan and he kind of thinks through the plan a bit. We, we learn a bit like this. He's basically thinking like the city is lost. Like he's pretty sure the city's lost. <laughs> That's one thing we learned. Right. Um, March will be the scape rabbit for, for this disaster. And if the powers that be don't accept his help in dealing with the fallout of this, then he'll simply appeal to Gimbel's enemies. And in either case, he personally ends up advancing himself. Yeah, it's such a deliciously awful plan like like the the idea that in his mind march is just a distraction like all the terrible 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 stuff that march is doing right now is just a a means to an end for him and he doesn't actually care about any of that stuff uh god it's so despicable yeah um we we also see in this moment though that that he realizes that uh rain did something to him rain knows that he can manipulate his emotions now and uh he's only got a day because he can only he he's he can put he can push these emotions down he can he he's got he's used to ignoring emotions or not dealing with emotions or or just, he's used to this whole thing now but this is so strong so powerful that he's got a day because if this happens to him a second day He's not going to be able to make it. So suddenly we have we have a, a super powered, uh, crazy guy um, with who's back up against a wall and knows he only has a limited time to deal with this stuff, which just like makes him even more, <laughs> even more dangerous. And it's like, so what Victorian Rain did to him was both good and bad. <laughs> yeah, right. It pushed him. It, it, it pushed him to a point of desperation. Yeah. Uh, which, again, yeah, like you said, can be viewed as both good and bad. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the chapter ends uh, this beautiful quote I, uh, the, that brings us back to the glasses. Mm-hmm, right. Uh, Cradle grits his teeth, clutching his mask in his hands. No glasses, no lenses, not just yet. He had only the thick congealing blood to conceal his identity for now. No glasses, no lenses. I'm not interested mm-hmm. in that anymore. I don't need it. What I need is the blood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and as you said, it, it wraps up with him, you know, he's drained the power. So he's, he has this, like, what is, was is described as a stronger emotion power than he's ever had. Um, he's never had any power as strong as this emotion power is. And it allows him to feel the heroes skulking around outside the building, which is like an uh Oh moment. Yep. Uh Oh moment. And so one thing I love is like, we don't even know at this point that he has like another stronger power, if not if not two more stronger powers. Yeah. A, a, t- um, a whole, a whole set. Yeah. Right. Which is interesting because I thought that, um, like, like typically, uh, like March didn't get a boosted form of Homer's power because she didn't drain Homer. Right. And cradle didn't drain, um, snag, but he still gets a boosted mover power. So it's just interesting that I guess, I guess maybe the rules are, are not, consistent across well, clusters or whatever yeah but he did know. he did drain colt it's true um, yeah so it, that could be coming from colt's version of it yeah yeah maybe colt kind of broke the pattern in a, in a way that works toward his advantage yeah it's an interesting concept yeah yeah so uh victoria uh, so yeah so we go on to 12.7 and we're pretty much picking up right from that last moment where yep. cradle screamed and victoria begins this chapter ruminating on the nature of power not powers, but interpersonal power, command, authority. And her mom was always fixated on this. And Victoria pretty much understands that, you know, the reason why she cares so much about it is that her mom cared so much about it. And earlier in the chapter, uh, she, she thinks several times about how awareness of leadership qualities um, 
sorry, let me rephrase how little awareness Cradle has of leadership qualities. Like he, he just, he's screaming and bloody and preoccupied and not really paying attention to the fact that like several of his underlings have killed each other. Um, and, and she actually later says that this is the antithesis of leadership. Yeah. And, and like we talked about, this is kind of, this is like glasses are the, uh, the symbolic through line and the thematic through line of, uh, Cradle's chapter. This is the leadership chapter. This is Victoria talking and thinking and, 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 and analyzing her own leadership. So we start off this way. Um, and, and we see that in this moment, they've had setback after setback. Victoria has tried to be this emotional, kind, rock of a leader that people can leave, lean on um, the exact kind of leader that we'll see. She says later that uh, Dean, she told Dean that he shouldn't be or, or wanted to tell Dean that he shouldn't be. Um, and that's gets kind of what she's become. And she sees cradle as not this person. And, and yet, as she says, he seems to be managing better than could be expected. Yeah. Um, and, and this, this is, this is a lot of confusion at like, what do I do? What, what, I, I don't know what to do anymore. I, am I doing things wrong and look at that? He's doing it this way. And, and this, this kind of in this moment of desperation as this battle unfolds around them, um, what is the right way to lead? And, and by the end of this chapter, we see, we'll see her leadership style, um, shift, shift, shift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's definitely feeling a lot of like uncertainty in herself and, yeah. you know, it, it's actually debatable how much of it is her looking at cradle and seeing like, that he's doing a good job because like to my, like my take was just basically it's not that he's doing a good job. It's just that he like paid these people and he's demonstrated a, a willingness to be ruthless. Yeah. And so they're just gonna listen. I don't like, think it's necessarily that he's doing a good job, but he's, he's winning so far. Right. Yeah. So it's like, it's like he might not be the best leader in the world, but his team is beating theirs. Right. And, and, and her trying to deal with it. Like, how can I win this? How can, is is my leadership the key to winning this thing? And if so, what, what kind of leadership? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because he's not a mastermind like but by power set, right. but he is he is kind of a he he he's kind of masterminding the whole thing. Like mm-hmm. March thinks she's in charge, but I think there's a case to be made that Cradle is actually playing her like a fiddle too. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. So um, can we talk for a second about the fact that um, Victoria's mom is a basketball and she triggered playing basketball <laughs> yeah that, i mean that's a great point um i i think that's I, I don't know if i want to say like intentional connection but it certainly is a is a wonderful image um also i can't get out of my head uh, like a, a better version of carol has the two of them like shooting hoops but the, yeah but the ball is her yeah the ball is her it's like a mom layup yeah. right like a slam I mean, mom dunk i mean i kind of want to believe that waste was like well, her mom is a sphere, and I note that she's really good at throwing spheres, so I'm going to give her a power <laughs> that makes her throw things stronger. Yeah, you want this? You want this? I, yeah. gi- I give you. You can yeah. throw balls really well. Go ahead. Yeah. Go, throw your mom. Go ahead. Do it. <laughs> I, know, I know you want to. <laughs> Who doesn't want to turn their mom into a round basketball and just <laughs> shuck them as far as they can? <laughs> uh, oh, yes. This, this podcast is a form of therapy. <laughs> um it's okay. So ins- My mom doesn't listen. Yes, yes. So inside, Cradle demonstrates some of his new powers. Um, he has, he can make just like slices appear in the air that cut things. Um, basically, it seems like a bigger and more flexible version of what Rain can do. And he can also teleport like pretty, pretty impressively. Uh, much better than whatever like balance power he had before. Oh, and he can just ignore gravity now. Cool. Um, and apparently there's like a tinker upgrade because the first thing he does is he starts kind of immediately upgrading his mega corpus too. Yeah. Um, what I like about these, these kind of flexes of powers and how they're, they're kind of doled out to us. in I think a very creative way while Bo recognizes that he needs to set the stage immediately and tell us, um, what the powers can do, what, what, it, what has changed in him, but it's mixed in with all this, this exposition from Victoria about leadership and power and, and these things she's thinking about, um, that we've already talked about. And as she's doing this cradle is like working on stuff. Like he just is like someone tosses him a rag and he just casually like cuts it in half to, to wipe the two sides of his face. Um, and he's just, he's grabbing stuff to, to tinker on his, uh, his mech and he's 
grabbing it by just casually teleporting over. And it's just like it's a way to display his new powers, but not in like a performative like this is for you readers way. Um, it builds it into the, the narrative of the story. Yeah. And of course, he he's also exploring what they are, you right, know, right. Um, which which also makes perfect sense. Yeah. And of course, there's one power that we know of um, that he's not. Uh, visibly exploring right which yeah. is which is what we left off of the last chapter with that that he knows that they're there as he's doing all this stuff he knows that they're all out there um and he and we're just waiting because we know shit's about to pop off and uh and and as as he's casually showing us how powerful he is now we're waiting for that to happen right and we have we have a suspicion that whatever the emotion power is it's stronger than all these other ones yeah. because that's kind of how he was thinking about it yeah so Rain continues to be super agitated at one point, shushing Victoria. <laughs> I love I love Red Rain. Red Rain is my favorite. Um, but I do think this is an example of something we're going to see multiple times throughout this chapter, which is uh, Victoria's um, team being dismissive of her leadership and her power. Right. She's giving command. She's saying things and she's dismissed or ignored or shushed. Um, we see this kind of I think this is this kind of is part of her building frustration with she's not sure how to lead. And also people aren't listening to her under the method of which she's leading. Um, Rain has an excuse here, obviously, uh, but she, she doesn't know that yet. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is far from the most uh, insubordinate he's going to be in this chapter. Right. Well, and, and he also, I mean, the other thing is that before he got red reined, he was talking back to her already. Right. Like, true. like before he was, he was all angered up. He was already kind of mouthing off to her quite a bit um, in a way that she did not appreciate. Yeah. You can almost say that he's over the course of the story gotten gradually sicker and sicker of being pushed around. <laughs> hmm. um, no way. I can't. Be no. It. no. Uh, so uh, rain fails to cause the soldiers to make any more dumb moves and then cradle attacks, basically ambushing the ambushers. His mech carves the building apart, and the heroes and hostages on the roof start to fall through the hole he created. Uh, Red and Mukade respond most rapidly, and we're about to become very familiar with Mukade's acid-covered razor centipedes. Oh, boy. Um, so at first I thought it was like a new cradle power that's making everyone fall slowly, but then I thought maybe it was someone else's maybe subside because he's the last person who... Um, cradle talks to yeah i think you're right i mean with a name like subside i think that the, the slow <laughs> the slow removal of something like it, it, there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of context there um also yeah wild bow drops his name for us like right before the attack begins which i think mm -hmm. is like meant to telegraph like hey that person whose name you were just introduced to this is what they're doing yeah no, I, I think that's actually fairly clear that that is the case which which is nice because I think otherwise I would have just been like, oh, Cradle can also slow momentum or whatever. Yeah. I think it's a great way of doing it without having to like kind of pause the action to say, this is subside. This is his power. He yeah. does this. It's a way of doing it in kind of a natural like uh, the implication is there enough to where you get it without having to spell it out step by step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Victoria gets splashed with acid in the process of rescuing foil from Mukare. Uh, understandably, this is pretty rough for her. It reminds her of the crawler incident. Uh huh. And she also gets like horrifically sliced up by the edges of the centipedes. Yeah, I like that. Like the the, the slices are are pretty bad. Yeah. Um, but they're almost nothing compared to the, like, the potential of the acid. I love how the text highlights this. I love how like as we're moving through this action, she keeps going back to the acid right it's like like she's she's trying to look at the whole battle and focus on this but in the back of her mind she keeps like zooming back in on the acid itself like this moment acid splashed my boot and sent a shock of black horror through me i just love that i love that a shock of black horror i don't know why i love that so much it's just a, oh, it's delicious i just love, I just love <laughs> it um, yes and then and then this moment where she's like just flying through the air and moisture is hitting her just rain moisture um and and it's like, is this every drop? Is this acid? Is this acid? Is this acid? Is this acid? This could be acid. They're, they're, the centipedes are up there. Um, it's oh, it's it's God, it's dark and awful. And and it's it's really good. I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's delightful. It's still so awesome. Uh, meanwhile, Sveta is going apeshit. Uh, she grabs the Carol orb uh, and attacks Cradle. Uh, she's also grabbing uh, the business part of Tattletale. Uh, Victoria grabs foil and rain 
and the trio crash land in the dirt as the battle intensifies behind them. Escape is obviously the only move here. The enemy are too many, too strong, and now already breaking out of the ambush zone. Uh, particularly Red, who has this very violent shaker power we've seen before, but if anything now, it seems even more dangerous because it can just... It's just so destructive. Yeah, yeah. I think the really affecting moment for me here was uh, this this moment where Victoria thinks that uh, it, uh, briefly in her mind flashes this idea that Sveta might be sticking around and not retreating because she wants to go out in a blaze of glory. She's she's seen she's she's messed up on the inside and she sees this as a moment of. Uh, stopping the pain while still being a hero. Um, and she dismisses that almost immediately as she thinks it right. Like she says, I didn't get the impression that Sef S S Sveta was doing that, but then she qu qualifies it almost immediately after that. It's like, Oh my God, this might be something that she's doing, but I don't think what this is what she's doing. Well, not consciously at least. And it's like, yeah. it's like this, this, this wonderful like trip through Victoria's brain as she's trying to process what is, what could be a, a horrible, horrible truth that, that, that as to how bad Sveta is emotionally right now. Um, right. I mean that, and I think that lines up with my impressions of Sveta too, that she wouldn't do that consciously, but right. maybe would be motivated to do that unconsciously. Yeah. 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 And, and I think throughout all this, in the back of our minds, Matt, is just this weld shaped bomb that's still waiting to go off. You know, uh -huh. like we, yep. we've, we've planted this bomb. It's been sitting under the Sveta table for a long, long, long time. Yeah, it's the uh, worst thing about the story. It's <laughs> the source of all of my suffering <laughs> and in life. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. So like, yep, Sveta isn't retreating. Uh, Victoria is forced to take a huge risk and go retrieve her despite the fact that Sveta herself is dangerous to approach in this state. Um, and basically Victoria is forced to throw herself into Sveta's range just to get the woman to back down. Yeah. And here's another example of uh, one of her teammates uh, ignoring her orders, rejecting her leadership and her power over the group uh, by just not doing what she tells them to do. Get, get away. Like, like, what are you trying to do? Like, get out of yeah. here. What do you not? You numbskull. She calls her a numbskull. What, yeah. what are you doing? Leave. Um, and Sveta doesn't. And it, I love like I'm trying to save them who all of them. That's such a Sveta line. It's so wonderful. I've, it's it's vintage Sveta and I love it. Right. And and Victoria literally doesn't know who she's referring to. But then right. we realize she's referring to the, the, the people who make up the egg. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But we see in this moment, I think I think we're kind of. Uh, leading up to Victoria's leadership style shift here in this moment where she basically yells at her and says, no, leave now. And she describes it as not the level headed ideal command I'd pictured before, but Sveta listened. And it's like this, this recognition that, Oh, when I did it that way, she listened. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's really interesting because I, I, I don't think I had really cottoned on to how, strong this this shift is in this chapter but yeah she's she's been especially over the course of this arc she started out in the situation where she was glad handing everyone mm -hmm. like like every every interaction was like all right let me phrase this in a way that won't upset swan song <laughs> and simultaneously my mom will find acceptable and but also i have to make sure that sveta isn't offended by any of the implications of it and and we're we're uh, as the as the ratchet of the stress level increases, she's beginning to lose her willingness and ability to do that, and we'll see where that culminates in in a little bit. Yep, I agree. But first, um, they're escaping. The Harbingers cover their retreat with a rain of blinding glass <laughs> wire spheres. Yeah, um, I think that answers the the confusion I had about the the wiring trapped in a contender, right? Yeah, that this wasn't just a simple ball bearing; it was a thing with stuff inside it to make it even worse. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it ex explodes and shoots sharp wire out through your tissues. Neat. Uh, and then Victoria grabs a rifle, or I mean, okay, the, well the wretch the wretch grabs a rifle, so it's not really Victoria's fault. A rifle gets grabbed. But perhaps. then she grabs it from the wretch. And then she grabs it from the wretch, though. Is is Victoria holding a gun now? Hold, Victoria holding Victoria. a gun. Victoria. I mean, she, she did she did do it in, like, the first arc. But then it was very clear that we were not going to be accepting guns. Yeah. Surely our, surely yeah. she wouldn't use it, right? Surely she wouldn't not. pull the... Oh, wait, no, she did. Surely she, she wouldn't fire it at a cape 
no. no uh, um, Matt, she doesn't fire it at a cape. She fires it at some soldiers. Yeah, well, that's true. That's, she mows, she quote, quote, mows them down. <laughs> um, now she says she's aiming for their legs and their lower extremities, so it's fine. But, uh-huh. but I love how the text describes this moment that she pulls the trigger, which I think as everything we've talked about with, with Victoria and guns and um, the, the, the symbols and the importance of her, um, her growing acceptance of guns, I think pays off beautifully in this moment where the vibration shook my body and reminded me that I had two massive gashes in my arm. Someone could have dug their fingers into the gashes and cuts and it probably wouldn't have hurt so much. So we, this moment where she pulls the trigger causes her immense physical pain is just like this perfect representation of the the the, the emotional pain, the the mental pain it takes to take this step to point the gun at people, um, even people that deserve it, and pull that trigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep, crossing lines left and right, and and the awareness of the lines being crossed as reflected in her in her physical pain at the act. Yeah, love it, love yeah, it. Yeah, me too. Um, so just comment on a higher level. This is a pretty fucking awesome battle. <laughs> like I'm, I'm really not going into as much detail as I could because it's just all too complex. Like just like little details thrown into like half of a paragraph, like Capricorn using the water stone synergy to splatter water all over the momentum slowing field and then turning it into stone so that now it's a barrier that works in their favor too. all really individually awesome, creative, cool elements yeah. Um, that make the battle fun. Um, don't have time to hit every single one of those. No, I agree. But. In classic, uh, we've got worm fashion. We're just going to say it's good battle. <laughs> yeah. um, cool. Inventive. Badass. Right. Don't have I mean, anything analytical to say, but I like it. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely stuff worth hitting on, though, like sure. Victoria's next duels, the disgusting duo of Barf Bat and Chuggalug. Um, Barf Bat creates streams of disgusting fluid that he then vomits into Chuggalug's mouth. He swallows the fluid and processes it. Mm, power synergies. Look, okay, this is gross, right? Mm-hmm. But it is gross in the best possible way. <laughs> Their names are Barf Bat and Chugalug, <laughs> and the one with the name, the barf in his name, barfs into the, <laughs> the one with Chug in his name. Uh-huh. It is perfect. It's disgusting. Yeah. It is. I love I love the gross bros, Matt. Yes. I love them so much. It's the best worst thing ever. Yes, exactly. Um, and so speaking of guns and lines and stuff, Victoria now uses the rifle to shoot holes in Chuggalug's flotation trash bags and then shoots a hole in Barf Bat's wing uh, after giving him a warning. Yeah, and we see it just like automatically heals, right? So yeah. not even effective. But it's like it's like I think Victoria's general stance is here. Okay, guns are bad and all. But like nothing is as bad as having to fight the poopy guy in hand to hand combat. Um, so I'm just not going to do that. It's, it's kind of like when Indiana Jones shoots that guy with the sword instead of having to like fight him hand to hand. But yeah. like instead of a sword, it's like super smelly poop trash. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're not going to do this. This yeah. is what she's saying here. So she finally makes it back to her team uh, as they make a fighting retreat. Her dad wraps her injuries. Uh, the Ashleys brag about having gotten two uh, capes. Uh, which I think means damsel killed two people. Um, and then the, the, does the number later turn to three people? It, it does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> which is funny. Yeah. yeah. I, I think this is a pretty revealing moment, though, because, like, they have full permission to kill, right? Um, uh-huh. But it seems very obvious that damsel uh, gave the, the finishing blow, that yeah. Ashley Swansong did not kill anyone. Um, and she still wants credit for the kill. But as soon as Damsel challenges her on the fact that I am the one that made the final blow, um, she she backs off. She doesn't argue that she says, OK, fine. Um, yeah. And I, that is interesting. Like she wants she's kind of wanting. She wants credit for taking them down, but she is clearly not willing to be the one to give that killing blow. Yeah, right. She I mean, you get the sense that at least one of them she might have like injured and 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 disabled and then her sister killed them yeah and and she may even be unhappy about that yeah like she's she's trying to we're we're, uh swan song is pretty firmly on the path of like uh, that's not me anymore right so yeah i think you're right so sveta tells victoria uh, that one of the things she was trying to accomplish was to grab the whip so that rain could potentially use it to reverse the effect uh rain takes this opportunity to be super emo 
Uh, Victoria tries to cheer him up, and then he responds, don't fucking patronize me, uh, which is pretty much the linchpin that triggers Victoria's blowing her top at the entire team. Yeah, yeah, we'll get on that in a minute. I I wanted to kind of talk about Rain here for a minute, um, because I think it's interesting to explore this this kind of shift in him. Like last week we talked about that the book introduces this idea that everyone reacts to certain emotions differently, um, that not everyone reacts to guilt, uh, in the same way. And I think what we're seeing here is an extension of that, that, that rain is this kind of naturally self deprecating dude. So his reaction to rage is not to lash out, um, but to lash in, um, the, the rage just takes his guilt and makes it sharper, makes it more barbed internally. And, and this idea that Victoria's entire plan kind of hinged on him. This was maybe in his mind, his moment, um, Victoria was turning to him once again and saying, I need you, I need you to do this. And, uh, he feels like he blew it. And this, the, the anger, um, doesn't, doesn't cause him to like attack other people, but it just caused him to really kick the shit out of himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I mean, he does, he does lash out, but it's, it's almost lashing out from a place of feeling so bad internally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, like it's, it's like, it's, it feels like he's still being harsher on himself than he is being angry at everyone else. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think so. But I, I do think you're right that he's still yelling at people. Like, yeah, he, he does, he does say, don't fucking patronize me. He's pissed off at everyone, but that anger is, is especially internally barbed. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, like we said, Victoria um, loses it. <laughs> it's, it's like, fuck you, mom. Fuck you, Rain, but slightly less than mom. Stop being so whiny, Ashley's. Stop maiming people, Harbingers. Um, actually, maim one more person, namely Barf Bat. <laughs> uh, Sveta, stop doing su- suicidal things. Capricorn, as you were. <laughs> hey, good job, Byron. You don't get bitched at. Right, which which is a change of pace. Yeah. Um, and and the, I love this. My voice was low. Brandish. Stop sniping. Stop throwing barbs. Stop getting jealous. Whatever it is that's motivating you. I'm volunteering my services and I get lectured. She asked, voice arch. <gasps> Fuck you. Kid. Fuck off. I said it with <laughs> emphasis. I glared at her and she looked away. I turned my attention the other direction to the front to, to the front fr- flank of the group. Sveta. So yeah. Anyway. Still so good. I love Sveta's reaction to this is, is it my turn to get yelled at now? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, so this is, I mean, this is obviously inherently satisfying, right? Like, especially the Carol part of it, right? Like, it, it feels like this is something she's been wanting to say to her mother uh, infinity times. Yeah, right. And it's it's really great in that. But like you said, I think this is a final payoff on the leadership stuff. We've been focusing on all chapter we've been talking about leadership and power and how that power is expressed within a group dynamic and i think right in this moment where she kind of loses her shit carol reminds us that this is all framed around leadership because the first time she loses it carol's like victoria be a leader um and i think what this is is this is victoria being a leader this is victoria being a different kind of leader sometimes just fucking yelling at people to knock their shit off yeah. is being a leader. Right. And and also, you know, Victoria knows her team better than Carol does. Yeah. Like, like sometimes these people, these people are volatile weirdos and, and Victoria just needs to say, like, call, call them out on it. Right. And, and it actually works pretty well because they, they have a dynamic where at this point in the story, all of them, if they're called out on what they're doing, they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I am doing that. <laughs> right. So... So it's it's actually the the, the right uh, the right solution. Yeah, and, and 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 that's not to say like okay, she's this type of leader now. This is what she's going to be. Um, sometimes being a good leader is being everyone's rock, um, being everyone's punching bag. Uh, sometimes being a good leader is telling them to shut the fuck up and do the, the shit that they need to do. Right. And and I think a good leader is able to look at the moments and and pick which leadership style suits which opportunity. And I think that's what we're seeing in Victoria here. We're seeing growth. And dare I say that this growth came from um, looking at cradle. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's fascinating. And another thing that I was, that you've, you've actually led me to, to think about is like, I I can't stop going back to this assertion that her shard wants her to be a tyrant. And, and at first I was like, that's impossible. She would never be a tyrant. And I'm like, well, 
this behavior right here could be construed as like the, the type of leadership by fiat, by by order. You know, you do this. Like that's I I don't think that's like I don't think this is just going to be Victoria transforming into that kind of person in like overnight. Um, but yeah. I can't help but see the, the relationship between those two ideas. Yeah, uh, we didn't talk. I just want to focus on what she says to Byron or not to Byron, what she says to Rain a little bit here, because I think it's it's wonderful and then completely in line with what we've thought their relationship has been this entire time. Basically, her 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 rant at him is, look, I'm not going to lie to you to butter you up. I don't like you that much. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's right. Just like, it's just so yeah. perfect. Yeah, I respect you maybe more than you think, but not that much, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it works because he's like, okay, like he's like this 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 gruff nod and like of acceptance. Um he's like, right, he said, his voice tight. Um it, it works, like this works on everyone. Um and and sometimes it's necessary. And yeah, I love it. Yeah, me too. Uh so uh Tattletail's head explains some things now. Uh finally making it clear that Rain is being influenced by Love Lost Power and that he can similarly fuck up Cradle um, by giving him his tokens. Yeah, I, I like this a lot. Um, I, I kind of want to talk about this a minute, just like a uh, an overall like high-level story decision because we had this great cliffhanger moment a few chapters back where we weren't sure if Rain was going to take the coins or not. And there was this really like this... W- genuinely scary moment where like oh my god he's gonna take the coins um he's gonna get a little bit of um of of cradle's emotional deficiency and that could send him down a a terrible path that we don't want him to see him go down um then we see that he rejects that like he he says no to cradle's offer he rejects the coins um and and he rejects that path and i'm really glad here after that moment that we didn't keep this as like an unknown thing over the story's head, right? Like, like we gave cradle his win for, for rejecting, or we gave rain his win for rejecting cradle. And we don't hold this threat over his head anymore. The story just moves past it. Like we don't need this as like this thing lording over our characters for the next few chapters. Um, Oh, is he going to, is he going to next time he's offered, is he going to take him? Is he going to be manipulated? Like, no, no, we're, we're past that part. We're past the manipulation part. Everyone has a pretty clear understanding of who cradle is now. Um, we've gone through the cradle chapter. So we, the readers have a good understanding of who cradle is now. Uh, the manipulation part of this whole thing is gone. Now we just got to, to, to punch him in the face till he dies. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like, like that's one thing I think Wildbo has always been really good at is, is doling out the the story, you know, the, the, the setting mysteries at a good pace. And then when the time comes, we, when the time comes, the time comes, we, 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 we share the information. Yep. It's done. We yep. move on. Yeah. Um, so really interesting bit from Tattletale where she invites Glory Hole to, lord over her the fact that she's horribly maimed yes uh, the uh, the tattletale apology is a rare and elusive beast <laughs> on first glance it won't actually look like an apology but if you squint you can begin to see its its plume of <laughs> al- apology <laughs> uh, uh yes. yeah she's basically saying i'm sorry in her very lisa kind of way yeah um, you can you 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 can lord it over yeah right yeah. It, I, yeah. I, it, it is you that were is what's, you were right i was wrong i am sorry yeah yeah it's the best you're gonna get victoria yep. um, and victoria responds so I'm, i i think this is really interesting because victoria's not trying to be mean here but the consequence she's i shook my head focus on the mission the kids are hurt our teammates she went silent rachel meanwhile turned my way and glared at me telltale hadn't known how with that power of hers i looked away um so yeah it's like it i mean it's it's fascinating to me because it's almost the worst thing she could have said like the yeah. worst dig she could have got in yeah but she, she wasn't trying to no she i mean I, yeah, you're absolutely right that this was not this was not meant to be a dig um she's just like fo- like we can worry about our shit later right now let's focus on uh our, our friends and our team um and yeah, yeah. somehow like the 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 she st- it shows she still doesn't fully understand how Lisa's power works right um, it's true that the, the fact that Tattletail wouldn't have known about this stuff um, yet it, it does not does not exist in her mind um, yeah and of right. course Rachel Rachel the fact that Rachel's 
she's so changed, man. Yeah. Like right. she's, she's so she's perceptive so to the, yeah, yeah. Like it's just, it's just amazing. It's like that, that it's Rachel, the one that is like, Oh, you fucking didn't do that. Did you like, yeah. Her That's understanding we... human emotions is like a huge. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. So as the team reaches the portal, they realize that their portal jammer has been hacked and the earth and villains are now raring for a fight. And we end the chapter with, with the wonderful line, fucking tinkers. Yes. Uh, that made me so happy. Yeah. Um, it's, it's great. It's great. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, I mean, like we've now got a point where like, like our team retreated, but they, they had the upper hand because the enemy was locked in and then nope, not anymore. Not anymore. Yep. Making the situation more complicated, more tense in an organic way. So can't wait to see what happens. Well, you already know what happens, Matt. <laughs> Come on. Stop pretending. Everyone knows that you know. Can't wait. All right. Let's move on into the uh, community spotlight. Remember, stay stay, stay with us. We're going to do March Madness at the end. Yeah, don't. Um, pa- well, you can pause the podcast, but don't, yeah. don't stop the podcast. No. It's an order. Never, 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 never. So last week's question was, uh, what's uh, your favorite pair of humans character who would have been a faceless background character in a lesser story? I've got a lot of answers to this one. A ton of answers. Uh, Sarah Penguin uh, says, Fur Kate uh, gets immediately personalized when they take the time to put on a cat paw before giving Fiston, uh, <laughs> Tristan, <laughs> Tristan a fist bump. Fist in uh, a th- trist bump. Fist in a trist bump. They get told to eat something that was that was that is not candy, and then we get multiple instances of them only eating candy before we find out why they eat it. This fleshes out their past while explaining their actions. We also get told why they joined Reach and that they have plans for the future. We see Fur Kate looking after other members multiple times, even when their arm is broken, showing their kind-hearted nature. And we also see um, we also see Party Fur Kate, who loves to hit the dance floor. They get personalized in a way that makes Moonsong saying they went all out against Scion willingly believable. What could have been generic Kurt teen member ends up being a well-rounded, fleshed-out character who is also the best member of Reach. Yeah, I completely agree with that because, like, you wouldn't have had to do all that character. Like, Fur Kate's role in the story, I think, is kind of to reflect a uh, a certain belief system in moonsong right um Mm -hmm. and that is all they could have been and they would have still worked functionally within the story but we also understand them as a person and uh i think it's happily correct that a lot of their stories wouldn't take the time to flesh out a character that that really had a very kind of focused and short-term purpose Right. Yeah. It's, it's so much easier to just say like, oh, well, the, the, narr- the narrative function is uh, they're a person who gets hurt to motivate the protagonist. Right. So minimal brushstrokes. Yep. But it's never minimal with, with Wild Bill. Nope. Uh, Prof Deadpool answers the question with, um, you're going to have to, it's like, uh, ho- 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 Hoyden? 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 M- motherfucking Hoyden, um, which I'm not sure if that is their full name or not. Um, I can't. I don't know who this is. Yeah, I don't remember this character. No, is that? Yeah. Are we sure that this was, is? A was this character? one of the people in in Taylor's, uh, um, you know, territory? Just like a, a, a uh, anyway, very on brand, Prof. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Ace of Sword uh, says, "Lab rat, circa worm." Uh, even if he only had short appearances for a few lines in the story, he'd piqued my interest, and there was the hint that he was a deeper character. And in a lesser story, he probably would have been reduced to some dude who hands over bits of tech that become relevant later. Yeah, um, that's good. That, I mean, we see it's kind of like Labrat didn't need to matter until the story, but yeah. uh, but they still he still does. Right. <laughs> Me for Mars says Charlotte. She could have easily been random civilian number 19 as a classmate for Taylor to choose to save from the merchants or generic goon number 23 as someone running Taylor's territory and managing the kids while Skitter escalates around Brockton Bay. Instead, we get a fleshed out character with a unique perspective on both Taylor's actions and the events of the story. Charlotte wasn't someone to get into the thick of the action, even stating that she wasn't much of a fighter when offered a cauldron vial towards Gold Morning, but her presence and character growth throughout the story made Worm that much better. Uh, I love that. I love that. Like Charlotte is is a very important character to kind of 
see a lens on what Taylor is doing that is that is removed from the cape shenanigans of it all. Yeah, and, and I absolutely agree. Like, I feel like in almost any other story, it would just be like a random encounter with a person from her past. Like, it would it wouldn't be this great character who who persists and and, and changes over time in the background. Yeah, yeah. Alternative arrival says Vista. Uh, the kids, the kid sidekick of a team of kid sidekicks who isn't ever really relevant to the story and the main character, um, aside from her relevance in the kid arc. The only time they interact is when she's on Taylor's Slaughterhouse Nine kill team, where they talk briefly. Uh, and the first time they speak is when Vista yells at some insects during the cell arc, and Taylor doesn't respond. Uh, in, in a lesser story, she could have been totally one note, a minor character that is fought in the background before the protagonist moves on to bigger and more dangerous opponents. Instead, the three major appearances, uh, sorry, in three major appearances, she became one of the most beloved in the story. Her interlude fleshes her out. Her session with Jessica gives us even more insight. And her final appearance in Worm is in my favorite scene, talking with Rachel and Miss Militia while they go uh, look, look over the place most of the story takes place in. Um, it is even more fantastic for her inclusion in it. Pour one out, man. Pour one out for this. I'm, I'm, I'm pouring one out right now. All right. Uh, Aurelion says, battery. Thanks for cutting down on the time that we have to read, <laughs> yeah. Aurelion. I think that's a good answer, though. Yeah. Um, I think battery is a, a really interesting character. I, I love, like, I know Assault and Battery's relationship is this complex thing within the community, um, and I agree with a lot of what people say about them, but I find battery this uh, this really fascinating character um who we don't get a lot of time with but we still take the time to understand them um and and it allows them to serve their short-lived role in the story yeah i think it was you know it served so many functions right Serve served so many functions even though there's real, really a very minor character actually yeah uh 1518 red says in a lesser story gary nieves might have received far less characterization we could have just been given the information about him that we got from Citrine's interlude where she's dismissive of him, but instead he got an interlude of his own. In his interlude, we get that he's a pure human bigot, but we also see why he's so frustrated and how deeply he cares about people, including some very compelling little details that make him seem very human. Yeah, I like that a lot because like Gary, um, Gary's role in the story hasn't necessarily fully played out yet, um, but we could have just painted him as token anti-parahuman guy yeah numero one like a yeah. lot a lot of the answers to this question i think specifically is like we look at characters who you wouldn't normally think this person needs a fully fleshed out backstory with fully fleshed out motivation and understanding and empathy um but they're still there right right i mean i i feel like everyone in this story who gets a name and maybe some people who don't get a name have like a full like backstory workup somewhere in, in wild Bo's notes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And even if that's not literally true, it might as well be like, like <laughs> every character is just too like consistent and, and, and obviously operating from some kind of internal logic that yeah. makes sense to them distinctly. Yeah, I agree. Uh, next up, we have Bar So Hard. I wonder if they mean Pure Bar, because that's what my wife does, was Pure Bar. I, I'm glad you said that, because I don't even know how to say that word. It's just bar. Um, okay. My wife loves Pure Bar. She's all over that shit. Um, anyway, <laughs> Bar So Hard says, Mark and Carol and Worm could have easily just been throwaway references to show the existence of Kate families. Further, Mark could have just been there to get hurt, so Amy has to break her rule. Instead, Wildbo fleshed him out with his with discussions of his depression. Wildbo also fleshed out Carol through her interlude. Because these minor Worm characters were not simply throwaway names, the first arc of Ward, Ward with the infamous picnic starts out miles ahead of where it would have been without fleshing out in Worm. That's very true. Um, that, that these characters that like understanding Carol in her function in Worm doesn't necessarily require a f like Carol's relationship with her daughters is super complex. Um, we've talked about it a lot. It is one of the biggest parts of this story, but it is not one of the biggest parts of that story. Um, it is, it is part of it. Sure. But it is not all of it. And, and the fact that it is still was relevant enough to be fleshed out there, um, helps improve that story, but also gives Ward, 
a, a leg up from the get go because we we have an understanding of this relationship before we even really start to explore it. Yeah, I mean, I remember it being a fantastic story moment where you're you're sort of thinking of Mark as like a prop, and then Amy heals him and immediately becomes like super competent and and chases Bonesaw away, yeah. like it, it immediately uh, uh, achieves a feat that few others can. So yeah, um, yes, uh, Perditorian mentions the heartbroken uh, the, and and specifically says you know they they kind of were faceless background characters and they they gradually came into the four and became very solid ones they, they say even as recently as tattletales interlude they were pretty hard to tell apart and then wild Bo suddenly went and characterized the hell out of them in just a few chapters kennedy chastity and darlene have become some of my favorite ward characters each heartbroken we've seen is distinct and compelling in their own right yeah that's yeah. great i just want to let the record show that you just said candidate candidate baba de <laughs> um and, and i mean some of them we knew from from imps epilogue right but like that's, yeah but very yeah. very cursory like barely yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i don't even specifically remember which ones were named in that interlude to be honest with you yeah i, mean, I could probably remember if i thought about it but yeah not right now next up we have star cross 33 who says ashley the slaughterhouse 9000 were basically faceless background characters in worm they had interesting powers but basically were just bad guy minions for the heroes to beat up then war she becomes a main character yeah, and, and even in even in Worm, we get little bits of characterization for him. Like, I, I the, for some reason, the image of the two Ashleys sitting there as the world ends together uh, really mm -hmm. sticks in my head. Even before I realized that one of them was going to be a main character of the story. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, I forgot about that. There's there's also um, I forget I forget the cape name, but the 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 one that 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 disguises itself and then gets immolated by uh, Crucible, um, where where you're like. They were just trying to save themselves. <laughs> yeah. 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 Bummer. Yeah. Uh, Regvlas says um, the quiet man and his daughter. And, and basically they explain that um, this is that these are not actually named characters, but they are characters that nonetheless stu st stuck in in this poster's mind. Um, people who work for uh, Rachel in her, um, you know, in her base. Um, and basically they're described, they are background characters, but, but nonetheless they manage to be memorable. Yeah, that's great. Nugget Blaster 69 <laughs> says string theory for her interactions with Lab Rat and being cool enough to affect Scion at all. Um, so yeah, we got Lab Rat as an answer and now, uh, Lab Rat's buddy string theory. It's really yeah. great. Thanks Nugget Blaster 69. Nice. Um, Mr. Coggs says Canary, the Canary POV interlude also serves as a nice precursor to the anti-parahuman sentiment that becomes a running issue in Ward. Having one or more characters talk about her case would have been far less effective than Paige's first person description of the skewed trial and aftermath. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just still thinking about Nega Blaster 69. Well, good luck with this next name. Then. Especially since next up we have Data Snake 69. Um, who, uh, interestingly enough, I like this answer a lot. They list Glory Girl in the context of Ward specifically. A lesser story may have briefly mentioned that she used to be a more conventional superhero before her life fell apart, but it would stop there. Instead, we keep getting more glimpses into the Glory Days. Capital Glory Days. That's clever. All of which served as a sharp contrast to the Victoria of the present. Glory Girl had no qualms about taking out her frustration on unpowered thugs, while Antares worries because she doesn't feel guilty enough about hurting a complete monster like Cradle. I like this answer a lot, Matt, because yeah. this is like kind of it's an answer that separates Glory Girl out into her own distinct character here and says, like, we didn't need to characterize that former version of herself as much as we did. But uh, the story still does it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I really love this. I love this answer. It goes on a bit, and uh, I, I think it's worth worth uh, going to check the thread to read it. Yeah. Waffle Jill says, uh, Chuckles, the supervillain Pennywise. I totally forgotten about Chuckles before this answer. but Chuckles uh, is terrifying. Yeah, definitely. Clowns are terrifying. They're all yeah. scary. It's Nobody true. likes clowns. Uh, Placid Platypus says, Blasto, there were there were a whole bunch of faceless tinkers who got butchered by the Slaughterhouse Nine in the process of collecting all the tech they needed to set up their dimensional hidey hole, and Ray could have just been one of them. 
but instead he gets a bunch of characterization and a moment of true heroism that makes what's happening to him that much more horrifying. Yeah, this is the old uh, technique of uh, making you feel terrible by giving someone just enough characterization that ripping their spine out and <laughs> uh, uh-huh. thanks, Wild Bo. <laughs> Oh, I love your tone there. <laughs> uh, and then finally, from Tiny Alchemist, we have Stan the Reporter. Interlude 20.x shows us Stan Vickery arriving on the scene at Arcadia High following the outing of Taylor S. Skitter. In a lesser story, Stan would have just been the voice from the TV delivering the news about Skitter to our main characters. Instead, Wild Bill walks us through an outsider civilian perspective as he tries to get the story to disseminate to the public. He talks about how he's had to become a jack-of-all-trades because reporter casualties are in- increasingly common. Um, and we even get introduced to his personal philosophy of Guangxi. Stan's character provides a look into the informational middleman and many other stories uh, that many other stories would have simply bypassed. Oh boy, I like that answer because that's another character I forgot about until I read this answer, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that guy. That yeah. was really great." Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, it's complex. Lots of lots of implication that this is a real person who lives in my brain now. Yeah, uh, my answer would have been the lady that uh, Taylor talks to on the train in the epilogue. Um, I love I love that conversation. I love that interaction, and we get little little bits of character. Her characterization is all serving a very important purpose to kind of contrast and, and speak with Taylor about some really important stuff. But, uh, I, I really love that we kind of get to know this lady a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think I thought of my answer. Um, but, uh, off the top okay. of my head, I would, I, I might say like Forrest, um, who is just like generic guy who helps her beat up, um, mannequin and then later becomes a helper. Isn't that the same guy? Yes. I think it is. Yeah. 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 I like that. Cool. Uh, so the discussion question for the coming week is... Oh, boy. <laughs> is Cradle to blame for the things he's done? Why or why not? Don't fight each other or us, Don't fight please. each other. No, just, just give one answer or the other. Note that only one is correct. <laughs> um, <laughs> do I, why, why would you do that? Don't fight, but also I'm going to do this to you. <laughs> I mean... I'm just going to I'm just going to tell them, Scott, I'm not the one who came up with this question. <laughs> yeah, but I I feel like I was kind of half joking. And then you're like, no, I really like that. And that's so you, true. You made me do it. I guess I do get some credit for that. Yeah. All right. March Madness round two Mar- results. Marches. Marches. Ma- <laughs> branding. Marches <laughs> Madness. Round two results. All Walk right. Walk us through it. So let's go through it one by one and uh, we'll be really we'll be really quick with this uh, because it's only round two. Um, So first up, we have the Earth Aleph bracket and the first matchup was Skitter versus Jack Slash. And uh, unsurprisingly, our number one seed easily defeated stupid old Jack uh, 88 percent to 12 percent here. Um, I forgot to pull up the let me let me pull up the quotes because I was going to do this, Matt. And I said we said we would do this. We did. Um, and I'm going to do this. Okay. I'll move us along. The next matchup, Jessica Yamada versus Idolin. Uh, Jessica takes it with 71% of the vote. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I, I think I can go with that. I think that makes sense to me. Yep. And we had no comments on these first two. So okay. whew, 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 whew. next All right. block blocker versus Miss Militia. Yeah. We got a few comments on this one. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, first we have Reg Vlas who says this is the hardest matchup of the round and it isn't especially close, uh, but they don't say how they voted. <laughs> well, hopefully they voted for clock blocker because he won. And uh, yeah, Roz says as much as I love, uh, Miss Militia and it's a lot, I got to give it up for my girl time snatch. <laughs> uh, so they voted for clock blocker. Uh, yes. Who, as you said, won. It wasn't that close. 61% to 39%. Yeah. Yeah. Next we have Contessa versus Echidna. Uh interesting matchup because they're they're both kind of secondary characters. Um but Contessa takes it handily with 73%. Yeah. Yeah, no comments on that one either. Okay. Um now we have uh our next big one. We'll move on to the bet bracket and we have Tattletail versus Lung. How did this one go, Matt? Went heavily in favor of our girl Telltale, eighty-two percent. Unsurprising, there. One of the 
favorite characters in the story. Yep. Um, next, we have Rachel versus Weld. A tough one. Uh, people like Weld, he, but people, <laughs> I mean, it's Rachel. Yeah, not enough. Roz says uh, Rachel Lint is the best character in Worm, and she should go all the way. I literally named myself after her in real life. <laughs> um, well, good for you, Roz Ray, because Rachel's moving on with 75% yep. of the vote. That's right. Next, uh, Defiant versus Accord. Which seems like a really fun matchup, actually. Uh, and again, we have 75% in favor of Defiant. Oh, my man, Accord is knocked out. And we have we have a commenter, Sympathy for Accord, who left a comment that says, Please don't kill my boy. Sorry, Sympathy for Accord. Your boy is dead. Yeah, I have sympathy for you, Sympathy for Accord. But your boy. I feel the same. Your boy is dead. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm I'm no longer invested in this tournament. Stop it. Now that Accord is gone. All right, moving on to the Gimmel bracket. Uh, Dragon was up against Foil. This was a, a tough hill to climb for, for Lily, and she uh, she didn't do it. Didn't use those yeah. powers. No. Nope. Dragon won 80% to 20%. Not close at all. Not very surprising either. Nope. Um, the tightest matchup that I've seen so far, Plastic <laughs> Wenye versus Vista. 53% to 47%, and it goes to Classic Wenya. I'm really surprised by this. I really thought that the, the Vista death would um, would uh, push push her higher. I, I mean, we kind of seeded Vista higher. Um, we seeded her five in her bracket with the understanding that she was going to get a little bump from uh, from her death, and it just didn't work out that way. And, we, you know, we did say don't consider Ward to be relevant to what's happening, but we assumed that you wouldn't listen. Yeah. I can't believe you people listened to us. What's wrong with you? I know. God. Um, yeah. So moving on to, uh, the next matchup we have Regent, the number two seed versus the surprise winner, uh, in the first round, Dinah Alcott. Um, and well, she won and she put up a good fight. 64% to 36%. But Regent of course moves on to the sweet 16. Yep. Uh, next, we have Number Man versus Garat Sata. And I'm confused, honestly. I mean, I like Number Man, but 61% to 39? I mean, I mean, I guess if we are going only by war, Worm, which you which you psychos have apparently <laughs> stuck to consistently, uh, then maybe, I mean, Number Man does get his own interlude, um, and, and Sveta doesn't. In fact, Sveta still hasn't had an interlude, which is kind of She's weird. She's never going to get one. She's the the Rob Stark of parahumans. <laughs> okay. Um, but th- yeah, 61%. I can't believe this. I'm so upset about this. Uh, we do have Regula says that if this included Ward, Sveta would easily win, but they listened to us and said they enjoyed Kurt more and Worm. Oh, um, yeah. I still, just taking only Worm into account, I still would not have voted for Number Man here. But, uh, and I didn't. But... <laughs> To be clear, absolutely <laughs> didn't. Um, next, we're in the shin bracket, and we have the number one seed Imp versus Parian. Uh, Imp carries it with 89%. <laughs> Poor Parian. Uh, Imp is a very highly favored character, um, which is going to make next week's matchup very, very interesting. Yep. Uh, next up, we have one of the hardest ones of the bracket, Glory Girl versus Chevalier. Um, we got a lot of comments on this one. Jamie says, you guys killed me with this one. My tallest says I had to seriously compartmentalize Ward Victoria for this one. I almost voted for her before I remembered how much I loathed her and worm. Well, uh, the ward factor didn't stop or d- the ward factor boosted her above Chevalier and she wins 57% to 43%. So glory girl moves on to the sweet 16 that lovely ward bump is uh, is definitely there. <laughs> yep, the ward bump is real. Um, next, we have you know, Panacea versus um, versus Leviathan, and Panacea takes it with sixty two percent, which makes sense to me because I think Leviathan is is a cool monster, but not like a character. It is a shame that this bracket didn't pair her up against. Victoria in the next round, though. I'm going <laughs> to say that. 
uh, and Throwaway says this vote was the biggest upset for me. Surprised Leviathan to beat to beat it, beat Crouch by as much as he did, and a little disappointed. Neuter mm-hmm. got so outvoted. Both Levy and Amy's popularity are a bit of a shock. But uh, yeah, Amy, it, it, I, Leviathan was a shock to me too. But uh, I think it's I think it was less love of Leviathan and more hate of Trickster. <laughs> <laughs> Probably yes. Um, but Panacea advances here and goes up against. Who, Matt? Tell me who won of, the final one. The winner of the Seamurg versus Golem is the Seamurg. What? People, what? folks, ladies and gentlemen, and so forth. <laughs> this is upsetting. This uh, is a mistake. Clearly, there's a mistake. <laughs> this is the was the, absolutely the closest vote of the round by far. Um, it was 48% for Golem. And uh, 52% for the Seamurg. Um, it was a difference of 34 votes, Matt. 34 I demand a recount. Four little votes. Um, very upsetting, my boy. Uh, my boy Golem is gone. The Seamurg does not deserve to be here. And I hope Amy crushes stupid and bring her in the next round. Speaking of which, let's move on to the sweet, sweet, sweet 16. Well, let's do some voting. All right. All right, you 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 go first, Scott. All right, so first up in our our Aleph uh, bracket, I can't even think of words anymore. Um, we have our number one seed, Skitter. Uh, she has handedly beaten all the competition so far, but this time she's up against Jessica Yamada. Oh, Taylor versus her therapist. I don't know, Matt. Who who are you gonna go with on this one? I'm I'm gonna go with. Taylor I mean yeah I I agree (laughs) yeah I'm just gonna go ahead and click that button now I mean I don't even feel the need to justify it (laughs) it's just uh, Taylor is such a complicated character and 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 Jessica she she's a she's a she's a good character um but um come on it's Taylor (laughs) I agree next we have clock blocker versus Contessa yeah so um Contessa Contessa has so far bested Noel, uh, or sorry, bested, uh, teacher and Noel. And to get into the sweet 16, uh, clock blocker on the other hand is responsible for killing Carol Dallin and miss militia. So, uh, who wins this one? I feel, I feel inclined to go with clock blocker. Um, I, at this point I'm, I'm reduced to flailing for justifications. Like I think I just, I think I see them as as more or less equally complicated characters, but I think I just like Clockblocker more, especially in his interlude. So that's my choice. Never been a huge fan of Contessa as a character. Um, I think she serves a function, and I like a function in the story, but uh, I don't think I voted for her in any of these polls. <laughs> I will continue to not do so. I voted for Clockblocker. Very well. Uh, I'm going to make you uh, say your vote first on this next one because I can't handle it. Okay. Um, the first Sweet 16 roundup in the bet bracket is Lisa Tattletale versus Rachel. Bitch versus Tattletale. Matt. Uh, um, I'm going st- to stay home from the polls. I'm too sick to vote. <laughs> no, you have to vote. You ha- your uh, voice must be heard. Since I read the questions, you have to answer first. No, I said... <laughs> you have to do it. Okay, fine. I'm clicking Rachel and clicking uh, vote for there. Done. I did it. I voted for okay. Rachel. I'm always going to vote. I cannot, like, I love Tattletale. She's a great character. I would have no problem with her winning the whole thing, but I cannot vote against Rachel. I can't do it. I won't do it. I didn't do it. Man, I I feel like in order to maintain some kind of balance in this podcast, I'm going to have to vote for, for Tattletale. That's the worst weakest well, most bullshittiest excuse i've ever well, that's heard not, that's not really the reason i mean i i think i think tattletale's interlude is what sold me on her and i don't know I, i'm just i'm doing it i'm pulling the trigger thanks for canceling my you, vote you jerk you, you can all just hate me okay yeah jerk this was the moment when i sealed my fate <laughs> the next match is uh defiant versus bonesaw Man, we're getting to some really hard matchups. Yeah, this is the redemption, uh, the redemption arc yeah. matchup. I mean, I, I've said before that the story wouldn't really be what it is without Bonesaw. I stand by that, so I'm going to vote for Bonesaw. <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, I'm going to do my duty and cancel your vote out because the correct answer here is defiant. Okay. All right. And that's what I voted. I think once again, we've just proven that you you are on the hero side and I'm, <laughs> I'm actually on the villain side. Yeah, you're a bad guy. Yeah. But just because you're a bad guy doesn't mean you're a bad guy. <laughs> I didn't choose to be this way. <laughs> All right. The Earth Gimmel bracket. First match, we have Dragon versus Glastig Uinye. Um, I'm going to vote for my girl, Dragon. I th- yeah, I agree. Yeah, that wasn't a particularly hard decision for me. Yeah, Dragon is um, it's just awesome, and yeah, I mean, I I think I think also Kira Glastiglinia doesn't become like as interesting as she is until like her interlude at the very end of the story. Yeah, the very very end of the story. Yeah, and then you're like, yeah, but I've spent this whole story falling in love with Dragon. So true. All right, Regent, my favorite character of all time against the number man. Wow, this is hard. Well, then I guess I must vote for the number man. <laughs> oh, you son of a bitch. I'm not going to do that. I, I, I don't I don't love the number man as much as people do. I'm kind of surprised at the lo- at the amount of love for him. Um, but uh, I'm voting for Regent. Yeah, me too. Uh, final bracket, Earth Shin. Uh oh. Oh Christ! So here's before we go on. I think we have to we have to acknowledge something here. We have a potential Amy Victoria matchup in the Elite Eight, the final of this region. Uh-huh. Um, but both of those characters need to get through this next vote. So uh, okay, go ahead. Just but I just want you to consider that while you're <laughs> making your decisions. Uh huh. Just consider that if I vote for Imp, who everyone loves and is beloved, but also I just adore Victoria Dowlin for completely unward related reasons, and it is absolutely insulting that you would insinuate <laughs> that the reason why I'm going to vote for her is because of Ward. I wouldn't insulting. I would never do such a thing. But um God, this is a hard one. Oh my god, it's so hard. I'm gonna close this my is, eyes. I'm gonna close my right eyes now. and I'm gonna click and I'm gonna click vote. Okay. And um I don't <laughs> I voted for Victoria. <laughs> I can't yeah. help myself. I can't help myself. I, I can't I, vote against Victoria. I mean I love I love Imp. I love Imp, but I can't vote against Victoria. I know. I agree. I agree. Rules be damned. Victoria. Yeah, damn the rules. Those those fat cats who created the rules. Yeah, what did they know? What did they know? All right, the final matchup of uh, the Sweet 16 is Panacea versus the Seamurg. Yeah, uh, Panacea. Yeah, done. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was fun. Woo! Everybody, go do that now. Yeah, go do voting if you haven't. It's uh, www.doofmedia.com slash March Madness. All you got to do is scroll down and see. Um, we've had some reports of people having trouble with the applets loading on Chrome. I don't know why, because my Chrome runs them fine, so I'm not sure what's going on with your stuff there. Uh, maybe you're blocking Flash. Check that. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, yeah. I tried to look up and see if this is a common problem, and I couldn't find anything uh anything but uh if you try another browser it should work fine yeah just or just reformat your hard drive yeah do that do yeah. that well that's all we have for you this week folks on we've got ward remember you guys are all part of this show now so feel free to provide us with advice questions or thoughts on this week's reading and don't forget to answer that discussion question that i'm sure will not be controversial at all no it's really fairly straightforward yeah i, I mean all joking aside like i think this is a really great question that doesn't necessarily have a right or wrong answer um so i don't fight each other about this like just listen just be charitable (laughs) yeah right it's it does i I honestly don't think it has the right answer yeah 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 but still be you know be passionate yeah uh you can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or over on our twitter account at gotwormpod my personal twitter is at scott daily 85 and matt's is at actually cradle was right (laughs) 
it's your Twitter not, account, man. I don't know why you oh, did right. that. Yeah, no, okay. If you're not already subscribed to We've Got Ward, we recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. Why did you say play like that? I don't know. As always, you can find this and all the other podcasts we do over at our website, doofmedia.com. Uh, you can check out Vat of You, the Doofcast, Deep Impact. Uh, our book club is coming up next week. So just go over to the website and check out all that stuff. And if you haven't listened to any of these other shows, do so. I like them. You should too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you want to support any of our shows or activities <laughs> or talking like this? March's Madness, I don't know. I forgot how to talk like a normal human. It, it's the March Madness thing threw me off. Okay. You can donate a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Supporting us on Patreon gives you tons of great bonuses like voting in our quarterly fan art contests and costume <laughs> contests, Q&A sessions, access to live streams of our recording sessions, and our excellent and lively Discord chat. As always, though, make sure you head over to Wildbo's Patreon while you're there, patreon.com slash Wildbo, and donate to him as well because this is his multiverse. We're just playing in it. And if you cannot afford to donate right now, that's absolutely okay. You can't instead help us out by uh, talking to everyone you know about this show, um, hopefully talk a little bit better than Matt has in these last few minutes. Um, <laughs> or you could head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. This week's Spotlight Review comes from Patrick T, who gives us five stars and says, listen to this ama amazing podcast. This podcast has taught me things about Worm and Ward that I never would have known otherwise. The hosts are incredibly insightful, hilarious, and so hardworking. Thank you, Matt and Scott. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. Thank you. We, we appreciate really appreciate that. that. All right. That's all for this week. Next week, we'll be back with more of Arc 12 Heavens. It's, it's going to get violent in this. It's going to be some bad stuff. Yeah.